want to drink a little papa's Absolutely. Yes, sir. Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. So that's what I was saying. So I wanted, before we get kind of started, I wanted to just say um, thank you for hooking the whole table up. You know what I mean? I think it's a really great idea getting this all together. Like all. Well, these guys are my mentor. Like, uh, Tiny looks up to Andy. I look up to Andy. I look up to Tiny. Uh, it's it's a. Uh, I look up to everybody. Yeah, I mean these guys are both <laughs> legends uh, and great fishermen and and great great people. No uh, doubt about it. So, so, I appreciate their friendship and their knowledge that they've shared with me and and uh, over the years. So it's very special to have this group of people together at a table. Yeah, sure, it's solid stuff. It's solid stuff. So we're in the new store, right? We're in a new connected by water store on the beach. I got to give ourselves like a little bit of a plug here because we just, this is all new digs for us right now. We don't even have an art up, art up on the wall yet, right? But we're here. There's paper on the windows. We're not even open yet. And I'm so lucky that you guys are just like, even still in this state, you guys still come see me. So thank you very much, right? So we're here at Connected by Water. Right? This is like Connected by Water Ground Zero now. And um, on the podcast, so welcome, gentlemen. We're here with Andy Moyes. Thanks for uh, If you don't know who Andy us. is, I feel sorry for you, right? So, and then we're here with Jason Tiny Walcott. Thanks for having me. Right? And John Los, my good friend. Thank right? you. And so here we are, Connected by Water, presented by Joey Cardi, Chrysler Dodge, Jeep Ram, and Fueled by Papa's Polar. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're hanging out. We're drinking some rum. That's Cheers, good. guys. Cheers. Right? Hey. And we're hanging out, right? And I just want to, like, set it up a little bit. Not too much, right? Because I really want to kind of get into a couple of things with you guys really quick. All right, so Andy, you're world class master anger. You're no stranger to the studio. You've been on the show before, right? Everyone who watches the show should understand who we're sitting with here with these two guys, right? Tiny, you're a legend, my friend. Thanks, right? man. So I appreciate you guys being here and you're giving us your time, right? John, I mean, Mr. Behind the Scenes, you like to call yourself, but in, in everyone who knows you knows, like, legend of a friend for sure. Like, thank you, man. Absolutely. Right. So one of the reasons that we wanted to get together today was one of the big reasons is that you have a story to tell us. Right. If you're willing yeah, to tell us sure. a story. Mm-hmm. Right. So which I think is to call it interesting is an understatement. Right. Because it's real. Right. And you lived it, my friend. Yeah. Right. And then, um, for those of that, you that have never heard this story, um, it's impactful. Right. And. You were, God, it's so hard to set this up because I don't want to, like, speak out of term. But you were involved in, in the hijacking of the Rapscallion. Sure. I was, right? I was the first mate on the boat. Mm-hmm. And uh, Larry Withall was the captain. I was 23. Larry was 25. And uh, basically we got... That's so young. Yeah, we were young, you know. And we were, we had, we had a lot of fun together. Um, Larry was a very influential guy in my life. He's a great fisherman. He was highly respected. Um, he was winning, you know, top captain awards for me. He was like 15 years old, you know, going up against like the Murray brothers and people like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he, he taught me a lot. He was very influential, uh, in my fishing in my life and so on. So we worked together and we worked on some old beater charter boats. And then, uh, we, we got the chance to, uh, work on a boat called the Rapscallion, which was a 65 Hatteras, really unique 65 Hatteras. It was balsa core. Um, it did like 35 knots in 1985, so mm-hmm. it was a rocket ship for what it was. It was yeah. built. That was based out of here, right? Fort yeah, Lauderdale? it was. It was ba- based out of South Florida. Yeah. yeah. And um, Sam Jennings built the boat originally from the Revenge, and I uh, built it for speed. And it was, uh, I think, there was only four hulls ever built that were balsa cord, so it didn't ride like a normal 65 Hatteras, where you know, semi displacement or whatever. It, this thing ran. It was. It had big MTUs and it was a rocket ship. And uh, he used it for, you know, tournament fishing in the Bahamas. And then uh, somehow he, he sold it and uh, to the owner that, that I work for, who mm-hmm. ended up renaming it the Rapscallion. So the boat had a, I had a, everybody knew the boat. You know, the old school guys knew the boat. It was, it was definitely cutting edge. And uh, we charted it, you know, and we, uh, we had a really good time on it. We were catching a lot of fish, fishing all the tournaments, had great angler. The owner was a great angler and his family. And uh, Andy's fished with him too, and uh, God rest his soul, Jim Cleary mm-hmm. passed on from now. But um, he was a tough guy to work for, but he was he was a man's man, you know. And he could pick up an eighty like it was a thirty. I've never seen anybody be able to do that and free spool to a fish like mm-hmm. you know. Um, 
So what we did was we offset some of the expenses of the tournaments by, by chartering, doing high-end charters. And uh, we had a charter come to us one day with a broker, funnily enough. It was all legit, looked legit. And um, basically, they wanted to charter the boat. They checked the boat out. They crawled all over the boat. And we were at uh, Pier 66. And then, you know, they, they gave us a deposit, chartered the boat. Um, a week later, we came out of the boat yard in a rush because it was like a weekend charter to Bimini. Mm -hmm. And uh, the plan was we were going to take one guy over and we're going to meet two other, his girlfriend and two other couples. And, uh, you know, a lot of things happen, which you can read in a book. I've been writing a book about the story for mm -hmm. 22 years, finally. Yeah, so this happened that long ago, Yeah, right? this, ha this happened in 1995. It's wow. actually, it was November of 1995 when it happened. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so. And Larry's, Larry, uh, just to give background on Larry, Larry's dad owned a tackle shop in the neighborhood. Right, Al's, Al's, Al's Bait and Tackle. Al's yeah. Bait and Tackle. Okay. Um, so I knew Larry as a kid. Just he was. They had that little gray uh, center console. Boat. Yeah, the running dolphin. Is what yeah, it's running yeah. dolphin. And his dad owned a tackle shop. And actually, uh, the owner of LMR got his start in Al's tackle shop. He was a rod wrapper mm -hmm. for for Al, which was Larry's dad. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the owner of LMR got his start from. Uh, so the the Withall family and Larry, they were they were early. Um, Pioneers of fishing down here, would you say? Yeah, sail fishing, kite fishing. Sail, they were in the yeah. scene. He, they were really good at kite fishing yeah. back in the eighties. Before right? anyone, w yeah, they, they Larry really studied Bob Lewis and Jimmy Lewis, and so like first generation kite days. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe not quite first, but he was, you know, he he figured out the kite really well. He actually mm -hmm. was the guy who taught me how to kite fish. So um, it's changed and evolved as we know. It's like sure. a totally different game today. You know, we didn't have balloons and right. helium. We weren't that smart back then. But we caught fish. There was a lot more fish around back then. You know? yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, so we had this charter. And um, a lot, you know, there was a lot of writing on the wall as far as shady things going on. And uh, they showed up late. And we were supposed to take the boat to Bimini. And they showed up at dark. And we ended up going. Long story short, we got to the, the old range marker in Bimini. And uh, I was up on the bridge. And uh, there were two guys on the boat. There was originally only supposed to be one. Which was the also two guys. Yeah, the two guys showed up to, to be taken over to Bimini. Okay. And um, originally there was only supposed to be one, like I said. And uh, so, wait, so, so, wait, so you said they they showed up or they didn't show they up? They showed or? up. Yeah, they showed up. We picked them up at 15th Street Fisheries. Okay. Okay. And we were running late, and we had the boat in the yard and Allied of uh, Fort Lauderdale, Allied mm -hmm. Hatteras. So we had met them at 15th Street Fisheries, and we were supposed to leave in the morning, and uh, we actually didn't leave until like four o'clock that afternoon. And I remember it distinctly because that's when the 17th street drawbridge was actually a drawbridge. You mm -hmm. had to wait for that bridge to open. So we made the bridge. Fortunately, I think we made the 430 bridge or whatever. And we headed to Bimini and, uh, we, we got to Bimini. It was dark. And, uh, I was up on the bridge with Larry and, and, uh, basically the guys had asked, you know, they were up on the bridge for the ride over and they were asking some kind of strange questions to Larry and so on. I mean, it, the charter seemed off. It didn't seem, and they were young. They were our age. These guys were, were they, young guys. Were they anglers? I mean. No, they, they were just guys who chartered the boat. You know, that we were supposed to, the pretense was we we're supposed to go to Bimini with two couples for the weekend. Okay. And then come back. Like, we we're supposed to snorkel. There was so there were supposed to be girls with you when you there were There were supposed to be girls that we were going to pick up in, uh, in, in Bimini. Bimini. Right. right. Okay. Right. So, and and one one the guy who chartered the boat was supposed to ride with us to Bimini to to meet the couples that were okay. there. Okay. So when they when he showed up, he had another guy with him. Right? Okay. And these were young Latin guys, you know, and uh, South American guys, and um, so they showed up, and it, there was a lot of writing on the wall. They they didn't show up with food. That you know, you know, they didn't provision the boat. And, like, it, it just didn't seem right. And at that point, we were just like, we got to go, right? Like, yeah, you've been waiting around. Yeah, we've been waiting around all just day. Whatever, let's just go. Yeah, yeah, a couple of days they had postponed it. So we're like, let's just get over there. We'll figure this out, you know, we'll, whatever. So we rode over. And like I said, they asked some pretty unique questions, which you can read about in the book, and uh, which mm -hmm. kind of sets up the rest of the story. But um, they had done their homework on this boat. Like I said, the guy who chartered it had come and crawled around it. He actually went in the engine room. He looked at the boat, he crawled up in the tower, he asked questions like, where's the dinghy, where's the life? You know, like, questions a charter would ask, but kind of kind of unique, right? Yeah. He did it on the pretenses of, like, safety, right? Exactly. He tried exactly. to act like he was overly safety cautious, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, exactly. It's and, and Johnny knows the story intimately, because in 1999, we recorded with Johnny. Larry and I both sat down after this happened, okay. just to tell the audience that Johnny sat down and actually heard the story 
fresh off the press. Like in 1999, we sat down. We fished extra- together in St. Thomas right. and BBCs, and so I did an interview type of story with them. So because uh, I was friends with Larry. Uh, and didn't know Larry and Tiny were so close, but I'd known Larry since I was a kid. And then Tiny and I did uh, some BBC fishing, some uh, charter, Thomas, yeah. some, some Harbor Island stuff, mm-hmm. uh, with Dr. Khan or whatever. Right, and, right. and then we did went all the way down to St. Thomas and, and did some St. Thomas stuff together. And right, right. Lived so together. Uh, at whole Saf- summer. Yeah. yeah, lived together in Sapphire. You know a lot of this story? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So... So Andy knows this story. He's well, heard it like I only also. know the story on the surface. You right. know what I mean? Just right. but and that's why it's like when we started talking and you know, when we talked about doing the cover of the book and the thing and things like that, it right. was like I really started getting more into the story. Mm-hmm. And then um when we talked about bringing it on and then John was like, No, we gotta all get together and tell this story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. so these guys were all fishing when this all went down. And it was in nineteen ninety five when this happened. First of all, I was thinking, it was something you heard about that would happen in the 80s, right? Nobody mm-hmm. really heard about this happening in the 90s, and everybody kind of had their guard down, you know? You didn't hear about this going on anymore. The drug days were over in South yeah, Florida. The go-fast boats are all pretty much, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, President Bush, like, put an end to that pretty yeah. much, you know, with the Blue Thunder Project and all that. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so you didn't really hear about this. Not that this was really, there's no proof that there was actually any drugs involved in this deal, but we assumed it was, right? And there is some evidence, but... You know, it's it's questionable. Like I don't I don't even bring it up, you know, what the what the motives were for stealing this boat. So so back to the story. I'm not gonna tell the whole story because it we don't have enough time, obviously. Right? It's like a five hour story. But yeah. but um the gist of it is we got to I got to Bimini and we got to Bimini. We're coming in the range markers at night, which is the old way in the Bimini, as you know, is probably really treacherous, especially mm-hmm. at night. You're running the beach, shallow reef and everything. And uh one of the guys came up and um basically said to me he stuck his head up the ladder and said, hey, I need an aspirin. And I was sitting on a bridge with Larry, and Larry was really concerned because it was dark, the reflection on, on the bridge from the eyes of glass and everything. He couldn't really see well, and he wore glasses. And the guy said, I need an aspirin. And I said, I said, okay, I'll be right there. And Larry actually turned to me and said, don't go yet. Hang on. He goes, I might need you to get in here. You know, I need, your, I need another set of eyes is exactly what he said. So I actually argued with him. I said, listen, man, I just cleaned up Med's chest. I know right where the aspirins are. I'll be right back. Let me just take care of this dude. So... He's like, all right, hurry up, hurry up and come back because I need your help getting in here. You know, I just need another set of eyes. So I go downstairs, and as I, as I crawl down the ladder, there was a big guy and a little guy. The big guy weighed about what I weighed at the time, which is about 230, 240, and he was about 6'2". And there was a little guy, probably weighed 180 pounds, 160 pounds. And, uh, That's big for me. Yes, yes. <laughs> he, he, was bigger than John, he was bigger than Johnny. But anyways, oh, so, a little guy. <laughs> so I, co- I come down the ladder. I, and I'd noticed that, you know, on the crossing that they, these two guys were like having a lot of conversation in the cockpit, having a lot of talks and in quiet, Spanish. Yeah, yeah, in Spanish, you know, quiet talks. And, and, um, so I come down the ladder and I actually, uh, I looked through the salon window, which had the blinds open and I saw the big guy sitting in one of the barrel chairs with a towel on his lap. So I assumed he'd gotten seasick. I didn't think anything of it. You know, the guy was needing an aspirin. I, I walk in the salon door and I actually opened the salon door and the little guy, had uh, waited for me in the cockpit. I walk through the salon where I step into the salon, and the big guy stands up, pulls the uh, towel off his lap, and there's a Mac 11 submachine gun, and he puts it to my head. Come on. Yeah, and he's like, get on the ground. So at the time, <laughs> Larry and I used to play a lot of pranks on each other, wow. and we used to play a lot of pranks on other people on the dock. <laughs> like, we were always messing with people, because um, we, you know, he's a pretty funny, yeah. gregarious guy. And I think this is like a Larry joke, so I'm kind of like... Uh, gun's like right here and i'm kind of like yeah right whatever you know I, like, oh, ha, I'm, like, ha. I'm like haha a nice water <laughs> pistol and i back up and i look down the barrel and i can see that little copper eyeball staring at me in the barrel i'm like wow this is this just this just got real but the wow. joke went too far yeah i'm like <laughs> yeah right I'm like, i mean i own a lot of guns and i had a lot of guns back then i'm like that's there's one in the hole you know i could see it and i was like okay so i get on the ground and basically they uh put a set of handcuffs and uh, a set of leg shackles on me uh, the hand the handcuffs were actually like black pot metal, and we'll get to that later. But uh, the shack- leg shackles were like a real pair of stainless leg shackles. So I'm on the ground, face down, tied up. They search my pockets. They remove like a buck knife I had, and I don't know what's going on. I have no idea. And Larry's still driving the boat. He has no idea. He's coming in to cut at Bimini. So the guy with the gun. There was only one gun in the story that we saw. The guy with the gun goes upstairs puts the guns to Larry's head and says, turn this boat around and throws a pair of handcuffs at him and says, handcuff yourself to the wheel. 
So to the wheel. To the wheel. Yeah. So that sixty five Hatteras has two steering stations, one aft for fishing, one forward on the on the forward console. Which so Larry actually handcuffed himself to the wheel, which he can still turn the wheel with a handcuff on. And um, he said, turn the boat south, right? So um, Larry turns the boat south at, at idle, and I'm just basically laying face down for, like, 15, 20 turned minutes. turned it with the wheel or autopilot? No, he turned it with the wheel. I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know I mean? Yeah, I, yeah, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't there. up there with him. Right, so. right. Mm-hmm. He turned the boat south, and I felt the boat turn around, right? And we're, we're basically idling. And uh, I guess about 15 or 20 minutes goes by, and uh, the guy with the gun comes back down into the salon, and he and the little guy picked me up and put me in one of the barrel chairs uh, in the salon. You were on your belly before? Yeah, I was on my stomach, yeah. So you, yeah. he was it's like hog-tied. Shackled. Shackled, Shackled hog-tied, hog-tied on his belly. Yeah, yeah handcuffs, hand, hands behind my back, right? So, so they sit me, in, a, they sit me in, the, uh, in the barrel chair, and the guy says, listen. He says, you're going to be with us for like four or five days. If you try anything, I'm going to blow a hole in you. And he said, I'm going to kill both of you. This is the deal. We're moving this, we're taking this boat down south. Do not try anything. I'm just telling you, I've done this before. You're going to die if you try anything. I'm like, hey, man, listen, I'm good. You're like, I'm cool. Right? Yeah, so, I just work here. <laughs> whatever. It's got, gun, it's got the gun to my head, you know. So so there's a series of things that go on, and I don't want to go too – this this could take all day if we keep going, but I'll give you the gist of it. So Larry turns the boat south to Gun Key Cut. The guy tells Larry to take the boat to Little Inagua, right, which is a place that we were very familiar with, mm-hmm. uh, which is off of Great Inagua. And – um Larry and I had fished those islands a lot. We wahoo fished down there and so on, um, on charters and stuff. So we, we knew the area well. The problem was when the guy checked the boat out, he had asked Larry, he said, what's the range of the boat? And because the boat was fast, he actually said 400 miles. Well, Little Inagua was 400 miles from Bimini. The problem was that's in a straight line. So when right. this guy did his calculation, he didn't understand you have to drive around the Bahama Bank and get around reefs and you know, it's not a straight line, 400 miles. So when he told Larry to take the boat to Nagua, Larry said, we don't have the fuel for that. He said, yes, you do. You know, you told me you had the, you have a 400 mile range. He's like, yeah, it's not in a straight line, you know? So, as a crow flies. As a crow flies, exactly. So Larry does what he says. He takes the boat south and he starts to get onto the Bahama Bank, which is through, he, t- he's, he lines up on Gun Key Cut. Mm-hmm. Name of the book is Gun Key because this is where it transpired. It happened between Gun Key and, and cat. So as we're driving through, Larry, this takes, you know, about an hour or so. I'm sitting in a barrel chair. The little guy is watching me and he's pretty nervous. And I can tell they're having a lot of conversations in Spanish. My Spanish wasn't very good back then, but I could understand more or less the conversation they're having. And um, the little guy was kind of trying to distract me. Um, he turned the, the, the TV on. He turned the VCR on. And what movie he was playing? Apocalypse Now, right? So, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, so that was one of our favorite. <laughs> what? So, so I can laugh about all this, right? I just want to say I have no emotional attachment to the story whatsoever. Okay? All right. So, like, I have all zero. Right. Okay. okay. There's no, no part of the story that you're going to see me get upset but, yeah, or freak apocalypse out. Apocalypse Now. Okay. All right. Okay. There, there's, no, there's no triggers in this story because I've, I've done the work on this. So, so and, and I want to get to the end. I want to just say this up front. This, this story that I'm telling is not a poor me story. This is the story was a blessing. The story is the greatest thing that's ever happened right. to me in my life. Like it molded me to be the person I am today, which I'm very happy with. Um, so I look at the story as a gift. I want to say that because yeah. I know when I tell the I mean, story. I'm sure like afterwards, like right after it was, you probably didn't think that. Yeah, it took me a long time to yeah. come to those terms. But again, it even then it actually, this story actually really molded me to get serious about fishing. It actually... Okay. It actually motivated me to, like, become friends with this guy and really study him to become better at my craft, right? Mm-hmm. So and this all has to do with the story. So I want to say this is this conversation is not – there's no part of this conversation that's negative to me. Okay, because I, I was going to make yeah. a joke and say I know Andy likes to get shackled too every now and then. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, he, likes, he likes it. So he was talking yeah. about handcuffs before we started. I don't just, know. Just something. not by Latin men. No, yeah. Not yeah. by Latin <laughs> men. He <laughs> likes the dog chain from what I hear. But, <laughs> but I wasn't sure if I yeah. should go there or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, no, right. he's, he can he can joke about yeah, it. Yeah, I can joke about this because it's actually it, <laughs> the story is just it's a story. You know, it's what happened to me, and I don't feel like I own a story. The story has taken a life of its own, and there's a lot of ma- amazing things that have happened to it. That being said, I've made the mistake of telling the story in detail a few times to people, and they will n- they don't look at me the same again. I mean, they, they everybody forms their own opinions, right. whatever that might be. But I can tell you. They'll never look at, and my close friends know the story, and I don't think they looked at me the same again, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I look at that as a gift. 
again. I don't Every, know if I ever looked at you different. I mean, I... Well, you know, you know, everybody has their own opinions. Everybody comes from a different place of thinking when they hear something like this. And most people are like, oh, God, you know, we don't want to... I don't, I, I don't want to bring up the subject. And I'm like... Pfft. I, I'll well, talk about it because it's very it's We very fished together, and yeah. it was, I remember when we were fishing, it was the first time you had chartered since that. Right, right. And that was like, you know, kind of where a lot of our conversations when we were in the pit together, when we were living together. Right, uh, right. Was so, because it was your first time chartering since this event. Yeah, and, and I, was, I was still on the fence about chartering. I mean, there was right. definitely a point where I, it, it, it's interesting, again, um, how, the the point of view Larry had as the captain and myself as the mate, um, he went after this incident happened, and I'll keep going with the story in a second. After this incident happened, Larry actually went got right back on a horse. He went back and chartered on another boat. Like immediately? Immediately, like within a few weeks. He actually got back on an old charter boat that we were on, and there's a very interesting story about that in the book. Okay. Okay, if it wasn't for him doing that, this entire case would have gotten thrown out of court. He actually went back, and I'll just this is a, this is a side story. There's a lot of side stories in this initial story. Um, Larry actually got back on a charter boat, and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, how can you? How is he not traumatized by this? You know, like right. how is he not? How can he do this? And he he got another mate, and I said, I'm not with you. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna rebuild the rapscallion with the boss, and I'm gonna I oversaw the boat getting rebuilt in the yard after we actually brought it back from the Bahamas after the hijacking. It was probably cathartic. I it was think. very cathartic for yeah. me because I love that boat. I used to put my own money into that boat. Like, it was like my first girlfriend. Like, I love that boat. Like, one day, and I will say this, I know, right, the boat's still floating today. It's floating in Biscayne Bay. And one day I'd like to own that boat again. Like, I would like to own oh, that. Wow. I'd like to own that wow. boat. That is actually on the bucket list of things. Um, I have a plan for it, whatever. But the owners, right. it, it doesn't run anymore, but it floats and... It's owned by a guy who raised his family on it, so it's uh it's still in one piece, which says nice. a lot about the Hatteras product. Yeah, for right? sure, a lot about what that boat has been through. So, and there's still bullet holes in it. So, yeah. uh, interesting. Oh, really? Yeah, interestingly. So, so back to Larry. Larry uh, actually uh, jumped on a charter boat, did a charter to the Bahamas, literally like two weeks after, and I think that was what he needed to do to make sure he was going to keep fishing and to do what he loved. Like that's how he cleared his head was fishing. He was a true fisherman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed back at the yard um, with the help of a good friend of ours, Phil Vitale, who actually ran the, uh, the allied yard. He's a dear friend of our, ours. And he walked us through that in an entire process. I'm, I'm forever grateful to him for the friendship that he gave Larry and myself to get through that process of the boat yard and then kind of just, making sure we were safe in the boat yard because a lot of things were going on at that time. Mm -hmm. um, not to get off on subject, but uh, yeah, so so Larry actually did a charter to the Bahamas again. And he, we hadn't heard from, the, they'd caught these guys. And these guys were sitting in Fox Hill Prison and we hadn't heard anything about a court trial or a court date. And Larry just actually happened to go in and uh, uh, check on you know the status of the trial. And believe it or not, found out the trial, the preliminary trial was actually that day. Blind, like blind luck, luck. <laughs> blind luck, like <clears throat> two o'clock that afternoon after lunch, they were having the preliminary trial for the two hijackers that would have decided whether Where was the trial. It was in Nassau, Nassau. in wow. Nassau. And uh, the, they so with no witnesses, with no witnesses and nobody showing up and none of us being told notified. No one notified. was notified. And I think this was this is all part of the plan originally. Like they were going to walk and Larry walked into the courtroom in shorts. And literally gave it, like no notice, no heads up, Come no nothing, on. and gave, Probably shocked everybody. Gave his testimony right there on the second on the, on the stand. Like it shocked him probably more than anything. He suffered a, treme tre a tremendous amount of trauma having so, to walk into a room and seeing these guys again, not expecting it. You know, because so, so going back, going back a little yeah, bit, right? So let's back up. So um, you you guys are shackled. Right. I'm shackled down below. Larry's shackled to the. Uh, You're watching to the, Apocalypse yeah, Now. Yeah, and the guy puts right. on Apocalypse Now. Thanks for keeping us on point. So no, that's cool. So I, of course we're watching. I'm wa I'm watching Apocalypse Now. Going, man, this is about. <laughs> I love this movie. It's about the last thing I want. Did to he see. put that movie in on purpose? No, it was or? in. It was in. It was in the VCR. Oh, okay, in VCR. Goes, so I was going to say if he did that on it. purpose, that was pretty. No, sadistic. no, it was in there because it was one of our. <laughs> It was one of our go-to movies, right? So, like, we used right. to quote that movie all the time. So it was Charlie all, Don't Surf. Man. Yeah, yeah, Charlie yeah, Don't yeah. Surf, man. Yeah. <laughs> Love smelling mint, <laughs> napalm in the morning. morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so that was in there. So I'm like, man, I could, I could, I could, I could have gone all week without watching this movie right now. Yeah, you know? for but, sure. But um, so yeah, so that's going on. Have you watched that movie since? Oh yeah, I watch the movie all the time. Right. Like, I'm a big Marlon Brando fan. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so the guy comes downstairs, right? So 
I'm going to, I'm going to keep the, not, not get too detailed with the time frame here. The guy's up there with Larry, the boat's turning. We're going slow. We're going like 10 knots. He comes down, the guy, the hijacker comes down with a gun and he goes down below into the Ford stateroom and he comes back uh, with a handheld GPS and he has what appears to be a silencer for the Mac 11, right? It was a 380 Mac 11, right? So he has this thing that looks like a silencer with a foregrip, with a grip on it, right? It turns out it was just a barrel extension. It actually wasn't a silencer, but it appeared to be, and it looked like one, right? Mm -hmm. So he's sitting there and he turns the GPS on in the salon and he's looking at the GPS. And I think he was trying to get a fix of where he was exactly. He has a gun under his arm and uh, he basically puts the GPS back in his pocket and he screws the barrel extension onto the Mac 11. And he walks up to me and I'm handcuffed sitting in a chair. And he says, where's there a pen and paper? And he like looks around the salon and he looks in the, I said, in the drawer. So he gets a pen and piece of paper and he puts it on the salon table in front of me and he said, sign your name. And I'm sitting in a chair and he, he's going to have to unhandcuff me for me to do this. And I said, sign my name. He said, sign your name. And he's cussing. And I'm not going to use the language, but he's screaming. He's a very aggressive guy. He's got the gun to my head. And he says, sign your name. And in that moment, I actually realized, I didn't know why I was signing my name, but I realized I felt like because of that barrel extension slash silencer, I was about to sign my name and die, right? So this is the beginning of the thought of dying for this night that took about 12 or 15 times more. <laughs> but so oh. this is the first time I'm like, I'm about to die, right? And when what were you thinking when he was asking you to sign I didn't. Name? I really didn't understand. I what did, his I intent didn't know. was. I didn't know what his intent was, but I just knew something <laughs> bad was about to happen. So right about that time, I, he actually unhandcuffed me and he took one handcuff off and I was actually leaning forward in the chair and the motors pulled, but Larry pulled the motors back. Okay. And this got his attention and he was standing over me with a gun and I'm like, Whoa, okay. Well, it's that's a good thing. His finger wasn't on the how trigger. Fast yeah. we, how happen. fast were you going? No, before? we weren't going fast. We were probably going when he like, pulled back though. How uh, fast? Maybe, maybe 12, 15 knots. We weren't, yeah, we weren't pulled back idle. to nine yeah, and he probably pulled back to idle. Right. So enough okay. to get the hijackers attention. And uh, the, he runs out the door. He hears this. He feels it. And he runs out the door. Little guy's watching me. As he goes out the door, while this was all going on, um, let me back up for a second. Little guy had gone down below to go to the bathroom or he was down below doing something. The hijacker gets the, the boat pulling back, gets his attention. So he runs out the door and realizes the, the other guy's not watching me. And Hold on, the and, little hijacker or the yeah. big, let's, let's call, let's, so we. The little, the, the, the little guy was down below in the bathroom. Okay. Yeah or doing whatever he was doing up front. The big guy is the guy with the gun, okay? Yes. And we're not going to use names, although I know their names. Mm -hmm. He walks out into the cockpit and turns around and realizes nobody's watching me. Okay, so the salon door is open. He's standing in the cockpit. You got one free hand at this point. And I got one free hand. And he starts yelling in Spanish for, for the little guy to come up and to watch me, okay? Or basically, like, hurry up. The like, big guy's yelling. Yeah, the big guy's yelling, right? So, so he, the little guy finally comes back, sits on the couch, and the guy with the gun goes upstairs to Larry. And this is when it got really scary because I knew or thought that he had a silencer on a gun. Apocalypse Now is blaring and I can't hear really well. But I'm thinking to myself, okay, I have to kind of come up with a plan here because I know something bad is about to happen. It's already happening. And I remember sitting in the chair trying to train my ears over the blaring Apocalypse Now to listen for a shell casing. Like I, I had shot, I own a lot of guns. I'm like, you know what, if I hear, I'm not gonna hear the gunshot cause I think it's a silencer, but I'm gonna hear a shell casing if it hits the deck, right? I'm gonna hear fiberglass. Yeah. yeah, fiberglass deck. I'm gonna hear, I'm gonna hear the shell casing. I know that sound, right? And I used to shoot off boats and Larry and I used to shoot guns all the time. So I'm actually training my ear listening for this. And a few minutes goes by, maybe like five or eight minutes goes by and I hear yelling. I hear muffled yelling, right? The mm -hmm. boat's still, idling and I hear muffled yelling and I'm like oh man this is not good this is this is something there's an argument going on or right. whatever um so just to stop the story there on Larry's end of it what had happened was this Larry had asked for me to sign my name to, to write a note to make sure I was alive because he hadn't seen me for like 45 minutes an and, hour. And, and you had signed, you had signed each other's checks before. Exa exactly. So he, you, yeah, I'll get to it. I'll get to yeah. it. So, okay. so, so Larry used to deposit my checks, right? Johnny knows the story intimately because he's recorded this. He's heard it from the, the horse's mouth. Um, Larry used to sign my checks and deposit them for me in my bank account. So he knew my signature. I mean, we lived together. We traveled together. We were like brothers, right? Right. So he knew my signature. I could sign my name. He knew it was going to be me. 
And that's the, the pretense of, of why they wanted me to sign the name. Larry basically told him, he said, listen, I haven't seen Tiny for an hour. He knew I was a total brawler back then. And that he was like, he thought I was dead, right? So this is where a lot of people don't know this part of the story. Um, so he asked for a note from me. Well, when, when he pulled the engines back, a, a, a series of things happened. It got the guy's attention. He thought Larry was changing direction on the boat. He ran out. He, Larry heard him yelling in Spanish to the other little guy to come up and watch me, um, but didn't really speak a lot of Spanish. So he, did, he just heard yelling. He assumed that I was like in a fight or dead or whatever. And then the guy appears on the bridge with no note from me and then a silencer on the gun. Right. Anybody in this room would have thought I was dead, especially if they knew me back then, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they don't need me. I'm take out, out the big guy. Take out the big dude. Take out right? the big guy. He's, right. the most threat- he's most threatening to us. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. If you were Larry, they're thinking, hey, he's... Right. Let's right. give I'm it a threat. Tiny. I'm a threat. They, don't, yeah. they need Larry. They don't need me, right? Right. So Larry kind of goes into, like, some really fast thinking and panic mode at this time, at this point. He's like, where's the note from Tiny? He's like, we'll get that later. You know, he asked for it. And he's like, Tiny's dead, right? Like, Larry comes to this conclusion. So he comes up with this plan that is pretty genius, okay? So that boat had, like, a giant gap tower on it. It had, like, a 30-foot gap tower. I think it was a 16 or 18 rung tower on it. It was one of the tallest towers around for tuna fishing in Bimini. Uh And on the crossing over, like I told you, they'd asked some some crazy questions. And um, they had asked Larry, do you ever drive from the top of the tower? And and Larry answered honestly. He said... uh, he said, no. He said, I'm scared of heights, which he was. He was, he, was, he was very fearful of heights. He never went in the tower. Like, I never, he wouldn't even wash it, right? So he's like, no, I'm scared of heights. He's like, oh, okay. So Larry actually f- formed this plan to get away from the guy. He knew where he was. He knew he was close to land. He was in Gun Key Cut between Cat and Gun Key. And he knew uh, on, on, if we were going to Inagua, that's the closest he was going to be to land, right? Also... Uh, side note, he actually grew up diving and spearfishing in Gun Key Cut. Like, he actually showed me. We used to dive those spots and lobster and spearfish there and stuff. So um, he knew he had he, – this is the closest he was going to be to get to land. So he told the guy, he said, hey, listen, I can't see, and I need to drive from the tower. He had already told him he was scared of heights, so the guy allowed him to go into the tower. He crawls up in the tower, and he looks over the side, and the guy is actually watching him with a, with a gun. He's, he's looking over the side of the bridge, watching him. Okay. So again, I told you, I heard yelling. So what happened was Larry said, Hey, listen, you have to read the depth machine to distract him because I'm going to run aground. You have to read this depth machine, which is up on the forward console. So the guy, and he said, yell the numbers out to me. Really smart by Larry, right? But Larry thinks you're dead. He thinks I'm dead. He right? think, I this, mean, Larry's acting based on thinking tiny. I am dead. No, I'm dead. And so he didn't hear it. He wasn't, right? he wasn't, that's, he was making choices based on the fact that he thought tiny was either thrown overboard or yeah. right, right, right. So he was no longer on the boat. Right. This decision Larry made single-handedly saved my life. I want to say that and give mm-hmm. him credit for it. This was some amazing fast thinking on his behalf, right? So he gets the guy to go up front and read the depth machine, and the guy's yelling out the numbers. I hear this yelling from before, below. I hear this muffled yelling. Larry actually steps on the ladder, the, the vertical uh, flagpole on the tower, on the belly band and jumps off as the guy's yelling numbers out. Turn the boat towards Gun Key Light, which there used to be an old uh, and sink the sink the motors. Sink the motors, yeah, you sink the motors and turn the the, the boat towards Gun Key Light, and um, um, n- thinking that he was, you know, once he jumped off, the boat was going to run aground and pretty mm-hmm. much stall out, which it did, right? So Larry jumps off, and uh, you know, from his his end of the story, he actually could. He said he could hear the guy once he was in the water. He stayed down as long as he could. He got caught in a current, and he popped up, and he said he could actually see and hear the guy still yelling the numbers over the engines as the, as the boat was turning towards Gun Key Cut. So, Amazing. Yeah, he, so... He didn't, know that, he didn't know that Larry had jumped. Yeah. Right. Wow. He had no idea. Yeah. Basically. So he actually watched the boat run aground uh, at Gun Key Cut. And it Cut. jacked up to speed. Yeah, so let, me, let me get... Mm. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Right. I got you. You can, you can always add, right? Right, yep. So, so sure enough, as Johnny said, I'm sitting there... And the boat actually, if I remember correctly, the boat actually sped up a little bit. Like, he sped up a little bit before he jumped. And uh, I'm sitting there with Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now blaring, and I'm listening for this gunshot and this, this shell casing. And I'm looking at the guy. And I actually had had a little conversation with the guy and I had a theory of where we going, uh, where we were going. 
That weekend, just to add another side story to it, that weekend, it was November 18th, 1995, that weekend, there was a government shutdown, okay? Like Congress stalled out or, you know, whatever it was. They couldn't come New, to... Newt Gingrich. Newt it Gingrich, was, they exactly. They fought over the, uh, the, the... They were trying to balance the budget. Fought mm-hmm. over, they'd fought over the budget. Oh, I remember so that. They, sh- they, yeah. they, they, they shut down the federal government. Or they, right, they, right. Yep, so there was a shutdown. There's a federal yep. government shutdown. And in my head, I actually thought that these were Latino guys. I actually thought, hey, man, maybe they're taking this boat to Cuba to like get some family members out or something. Right? That's what I originally thought. And I actually discussed that with a guy, and, and he agreed to it. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. He just kind of like blew it off. But So I'd had this conversation with him, and then I hear, feel the boat speed up, and I actually remember the back of the boat lifting up, which was a really eerie feeling. And uh, I, I can, I'm glad to say I've never experienced this feeling again, but it actually is like the bank cushion effect. When, when a boat gets in shallow water and its displacement will cause the, back oh, end, right. mm-hmm. cause the back end to actually lift up in shallow water from the force of the propellers. And it actually came up at a really strange angle, and then, boom, we ran aground. Um, one of the engines shut off, and uh, I was like, oh, God, right? I, I can't even tell you how many things were going through my mind at that point because, number one, it was loud. How right. fast were you going when we you We were hit? probably going like 12, 14 knots, I'd say, somewhere in there. Wow. You know, not, not super fast, but uh, fast enough for the boat to pick up and then hit really hard, you know, hit a coral head at 14 knots loud. And um, so I'm like, oh, man. So one of the thoughts I had immediately was Larry's dead. That's exact, That's the first thought I had. Like, right. Larry is dead. He just caught a bullet, right? He's done. So the guy, come, the guy with the gun comes off the bridge flying down the ladder. I mean – moving fast and he comes in and sticks the gun right to my head and he's like get up now i have one handcuff off right he's like get up you're driving i'm like where's larry he's like larry jumped i'm like i didn't believe it mm-hmm. right i still have the shackles on he's smashing me with a gun he's like get your ass outside drive get up on this bridge you have to drive this boat at this time one engine had shut off and it actually was not stuck on the bottom the boat was going around in a circle and keep in mind i have no idea where we are right like i know we right. went, i know from my my, my internal compass, we went south, but I don't know anything else. So I have the leg shackles on, and I walk into the cockpit. It was very hard. They were tight, and it was really hard to, to walk in them. You, know, you see people in jailhouse trying to walk in shackles. And he's like, get up the ladder. I'm like, oh, man. You know? so, the- so I went up the ladder with the shackles on, which actually tore, tore the hell out of my, my ankles. Yeah, right? I, I still have scars from it. But, so I go up the ladder, and I went up really, really slow, number one, because it was hurting. Number two... Because I just figured I was going to see my friend dead. You know, I was, mm-hmm. I, was, I was expecting it fully. And it was like, again, like slow motion when you have a pretty intense experience going on, right? So I go up the ladder and I look about, you know, eye level on the bridge. And uh, I don't see anybody. And I'm like, hmm. I don't, I don't even know what to think, right? I'm right. like, okay, he's not here. That's a good thing. So I stand up. I go to the forward helm. And I remember looking up and... Um, I remember seeing gun key light, but not knowing what it was because the boat was basically one engine was shut off. So the boat was kind of going in a, in a wide circle. And I think it, I think it hit a couple more times. Like it was just like, you know, taking out sea fans because we're in really shallow water. And I had no idea where we were. I saw a gun key light, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't acknowledge it. I didn't know that was gun key light. I just kept seeing this light going around. Or which side of the, yeah, where we were or whatever. Right. So we had, um, an old Trimble nav graphics machine. And it was one of the first, like, picture GPSs back then, you know. Mm-hmm. GPS had only come out in the early 90s, you know. And uh, so this one old black and white Trimble machine. I remember looking at it and then seeing South Bimini uh, on the chart. And keep in mind, I wasn't a captain. I was a mate, and fishing was my job. Driving was not at that time. So I wasn't my, really 23 years old. Yeah, too. I'm 23 years yeah. old. And I really wasn't, you know, the 23-year-olds today can navigate acro- around the world. Uh, that wasn't me back then, you know. Right. So... I, I see South Bimini. I'm like, okay, there's a target. Straighten the boat out on one engine, and uh, I start heading towards South Bimini on the back side, the east side of Gun Key, which is very shallow water, right? I'm not looking at depths. So I just see South Bimini, and I start heading towards it. And in front of me, um, I see, like, a white flare go off, literally going from, from west to east. It was a white flare in the air, aerial flare, and I'm like – Whoa, what, what, like that messed me up because yeah. I was thinking, I don't, the boat's been going around in circles. I'm thinking Larry was in the water shooting flares off because I'm kind of starting to believe that he was in the water, right? And so, you, and you didn't see any blood on the deck? I didn't deck. see any blood on the deck or anything. There was no evidence of, that he had gotten was, killed. Was the handcuff that he had on, was that still on the mm-hmm. wheel? Mm-mm. Still, no? No. How do you get, 
Larry talked him into taking the handcuff off so he could go to the tower. Oh, because he had told him I right. to have to go to the gotcha. tower, right? Gotcha. Yeah. So, so the handcuff wasn't there. Um, I don't. The guy. I think the guy had the handcuffs. He took both yeah. of them off, of Larry. Um, I still had one on. Oh, one was attached. The other mm-hmm. one was loose. So, as I'm going north towards towards uh, uh, South Bimini, I see this flare go off, and the hijacker does not see the flare. And I pulled the engines back because I'm heading in that direction. I'm like, that's Larry. I'm going to run him over. And then I'm like, how can I, you know, I got to get to South Bimini because that's the closest point of marina, land, whatever. And he, uh, I see another flare. I think it was like two or three flares I witnessed going off, right? He still never saw them until like the fourth flare. And he's like, what, what was that? You know, and like he got really panicked and freaked out. It turns out that those flares were not Larry. Those flares were people at Honeymoon Harbor on the uh, east side of Gun Key, just whatever, shooting white flares off. A white flare at really? night actually means helicopter and landing. I learned that afterwards. But okay. there were just people. It was either fireworks or flares. Do whatever. you think that they heard the, the, the impact? Or no, I think they were just dr- drunk, just drunk shooting okay. flares off, yeah. like sailboaters or whatever, you know, hanging out. Um, so I started heading towards Bimini. I'm still going in the same direction. And uh, the hijacker gets super panicked, and he's like, where are you going, blah, blah, blah. He starts screaming at me, hitting me with a gun. I said, listen, mister. I said, he's hitting you? Yeah, he hit me a couple times with a gun. Like, I was beat up pretty, not Pistol terribly, whipped him. Yeah, pistol whipped at that yeah. point. You'd hit me with a gun. And, you know, the adrenaline and everything, I can't say that had a huge impact on me. It didn't. But at right. the end of it, I was beat up pretty badly. Like, he'd hit me in the, in the head with a gun probably ten times, you know, wow. five or ten times. But not hard, just, you know, like hard enough to get my attention and hurt. So I said, listen, mister, I'm, I'm taking this boat. You can have this boat. Like, I'm taking this boat to South Bimini, and I'm going to get off it. And he's like, no, you're not. Turn the boat around. We're going to Inagua. And I'm like, oh. and he's screaming at me. Like, he's got the gun in my face at this point. So I turned the boat around. End up stuck in deep water. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I knew we were in shallow, shallow water because I could see the death machine. And I had warned him. I said, listen, we're in shallow water here. And he's like, turn this boat around. So in, in that second, it was almost um, – a relief because I was turning away from where I thought Larry was when, well, in fact, I actually was heading, when I turned the boat around, I was heading straight back to Larry. Larry was in the water getting uh, washed. I was an outgoing tide and he was getting washed out. And he actually, Larry was in the water and actually watched the boat and the running lights turn back towards him and start coming straight towards him. And then the hijacker told me to speed up. Keep in mind, I'm on one engine. And right? you don't see him. You don't know he's no, there. No, it's yeah. pitch black, right? right. You're on one like, engine from the damage yeah. when you hit the, the first coral head. Correct, right? So one engine had shut off from, from the first time the boat hit. So I'm starting to get my bearings of where I am. And I see gun key cut, and I see cat, uh, cat key, and I see the houses. I can see the lights from the mansions on cat key. And I could almost see the marina off in the distance. And I'm getting, I'm starting to figure out where I am. Because I've been through Gun Key Cut a bunch of times with mm-hmm. him. So the guy's screaming at me. And there's a lot going on at this point. And I realized, I said, you know, um, he wants to go to Nagua. I'm just trying to find, I don't even know how to get to Nagua, uh, right. to navigate to Nagua. I'm just going to, and I. You just want to get that dude off your boat. Exactly. I, wanna, <laughs> or, I just want to get him, him get off the boat. I, wanna, I, I just want this to end quickly. And this yeah. is where the story gets interesting. So. So I'm looking at the depth, and depth, the depth, I think we were in, like, I think I had, like, three or four feet under the hull, right? Because it's real shallow in that area, and I'm, that is freaking me out. And I warned him. I said, listen, we're going to run aground. And I was trying. He was screaming at me, but I remember this is the first time I, I had to really control myself ever in my life to not to really control my voice with people. Like, I talked to him, like, very calmly. Collected. Very collected, yeah. and it, it served me well since this night, right? Like your I, life depended like on it. Like my life yeah. depended on it. And it's funny because whenever I get into a really serious emergency situation, I've been in a few since, people say you're very calm and clear in these situations, and it comes from this. This is this is one of the byproducts of this, this experience. So good byproducts. So I figure out where we are, and I tell him we're going to run aground. I have to get to deep water, and he's rushing me to speed up, right? He's panicked. And he was, he would go to, to tell you about the hijacker, you know, he weighed like 240 pounds. He's a big dude. Um, he would go from calm to literally like off the Richter chain. Like, I mean, just like his, he was, pain, he would go from impulsive. Pain, yeah. He would just go from like wow. quiet to like screaming and hitting me with a gun. I mean, it was just like, it was almost like he was on drugs, which I'm pretty sure he probably was. Right. So it was very unnerving. And I told him, I said, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to run aground. Just, I'm like, listen, stop hitting me with a gun, please. I said it very calmly. I was like, just, just let me figure out where, where I'm at, you know? So 
I start to figure out where I am, and he's still You're rushing. Like make this guy realize that he needs Could you. Could you imagine the stress yeah. he, this guy yeah, is under? I mean, the stress. Pretty stressful. No, I can't. I mean, it's, it's yeah. your, your mind, I've learned, your, your brain will take over, right? We have natural survival instincts that mm -hmm. kick in in these situations, right? It's, it's the fight or flight, or fight, flight, or freeze, the three. I've studied them since this. I've learned a lot about people who go through these kinds of situations, right? I've actually m made it a point to study it, so... I, I, uh, I'm very grateful for this experience. So I see the mansions and I see that I am too far southeast of Gun Key Cut. You have to hug Gun Key to make it through Gun Key Cut safely. And I'm too far south. So, so I, you know you're going to hit ground. I'm screwed, right? I know that. But because of the lights and I could see the marina, their civilization, and I figure, you know what, he's, he's, he's really on me to speed up. So I figured, you know what, let me just run this thing up on the beach. Somebody's got to yeah. hear it. I got one engine. There's no way I can yeah, take you're this like, boat fine, to another. asshole. You want to speed up here? Exactly. Yeah. That was literally what I did, right? Yeah. So I push it up. I push up the one engine. I think it was a starboard engine, if I remember right. It was just, I'm wrong. It was a port engine. I push the port engine up as fast as I can, right? I, I put it in a corner, which was still only like 15, 18 knots. And uh, I just, I, I knew I was going to hit. So it was just a matter of when. And it was dark. And he was standing right next to me. And I just piled it up right onto the reef that's on the north side of uh, Cat Key, purposely. And you can look at the internet. There's pictures of the boat on the side, like, mm -hmm. like keeled over. And it, the tide was going out, right? So, um, so the boat keels over immediately as I, run a, as I run aground. And I remember it comes to this crunching stop. And he's freaking out on me. And I remember, like, pulling it out of gear and then putting it back in gear. And the propeller was actually out of the, the port side propeller was actually out of the water. And when I put it in gear, there must have been enough water. I, I don't know if you've ever heard like a, a, a 40 inch prop or 48 inch prop spin when it's out of the water, but it's a horrifying, a horrifying sound, mm -hmm. right? It sounds like, it sounds like a hundred samurai swords. like Andy swords. when he's shackled? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like Andy in his dog chain, right? <laughs> so anyway, we'll get to him in a minute, you know? Andy, you didn't know you were going to be the guy getting beat on this whole time, huh? Anyway. It's so, the only time I can do is when we're actually being filmed and it's like witnesses, right? Yeah, yeah I wouldn't mess with this dude. In a closed room, I'm like, yeah. I'm not saying shit. Yeah, yeah, he's hands down one of the most dangerous people you ever want to meet. That yeah. is hands down for sure. I can, I can concur. I've, I, I've, I've seen, seen it. I, I've seen, I've seen the dark doing? side. Good. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Sorry, I'm taking up all no, that. No, no, no. no, no. We're, well, no what's your, what's your uh, comment so far? On, uh, well, I mean, I was around when all this happened, you know, and of all the years I've known Tiny, I've only ever heard the story once because he really didn't want to talk about it, and I don't blame him, you know, and uh, I'm sure people have asked him a thousand times to tell him a story, and it's just... It's a long story. It's a long I story. I want people to, you know, to, to what he just said, I want people to kind of understand... Like the value and the importance of you actually sitting here with us and telling this story. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, and that's not lost on me. You know what I mean? And and, and I appreciate that that you're doing that with thank us you. today. So thank you. And so, also you know, writing the book. I don't take this yeah. moment for granted. So yeah, I appreciate that. at all. I appreciate that. You know, the story is just a story, right? The story is something that happened. You know, what I've learned about what happens and the story you tell about it. There's a big difference there. And that's what my book is about. The book tells the story, it tells kind of who I am. But really, my, my focus and my drive for writing the book is the takeaway, mm -hmm. right? A lot of us get stuck in our stories that we tell ourselves about what happened. There is what happened. There is a story that we tell ourselves about what happened. Right. And that is where the choice and the power comes in. And I've learned that you can change the story you tell yourself about what happened, if that makes any sense. It does I, I've completely. met a lot of victims. I've, I've never been a victim. I've never been a victim of a hijacking, right? I do not consider myself a victim. It was an experience. Mm -hmm. There's people who choose. That's to be, strong, to be, man. That's to be, strong. Well, this is, this, is, this is the fundamental. This is the, uh, the foundation of, of what I, uh, why I continue to push this story or tell this story. This is the relevance of the story. The, the, the hijacking, it'll never happen to me again. I, I know that for a fact. That will never happen again. Why would I want to stay stuck in it? Except every day in life, I see people who stay stuck in their stories about what happened right. to them. They allow well, it to become their identity. Exactly. Yeah. They allow it to define them for who they and are. And destroy them in many and, cases. And, and exactly. And hold them back. Or, and so, so, you know, coming back to the book, and I'll get to the climax. I'm going to give you the climax here in a minute. Coming back to the book, I, I wrote the book originally as a thriller to tell the story like I'm telling you, right? And then somebody said, why don't you write it as a gift? Mm -hmm. back to the world that anybody could relate to, not just fishermen or captains. 
And that really fueled me because I'd, I'd been stuck on it and I'd been procrastinating on it and I really didn't have the drive to do it. I didn't have the why. And then when somebody said that to me, I said, you know, there's so many good lessons from this experience, you know, um, let me push forward with it. Another one of the motivating factors is um, Larry, my dear friend who I went through this experience with, he never really recovered from this experience. We went about it and we dealt wow, with it. Wow, really? Yeah, we never... We I, went can, I can say the same thing because I was friends with Larry after... Right, in, right. He, he never... He, he had come from... He was a very happy, uh, fun, fun-loving guy, a, a, a great jokester, uh, a, a personality. His, his personality was larger than life. His whole life, he never really dealt with anything, you know, he, nobody, he'd never been in a fist fight. He had never been, you know, had any kind of altercations with people because people just loved him wherever he went. Like, people loved the guy. Like, you couldn't, even, you couldn't stay mad at him for long. Cause Wouldn't he was you just agree, a, Moise? He was just a fun, he would make you laugh. Yeah, I yeah. mean, even if you, I, you know, if you got pissed off at him, he'd make you laugh. And the thing about it is this, this experience, um, you know, it, 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 uh, it affected him greatly. It affected him greatly. I... I, it affected me differently. I came from a turbulent childhood. I was born in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica, and I was in the 70s, which was a very turbulent, violent place. Mm -hmm. My father was a lawyer and whatever. But, but so we had different upbringings. You know, he grew up in Fort Lauderdale, and he kind of was, you know, he was, he was well-known in Fort Lauderdale. He had tons of friends. I mean. Yeah. His dad uh, had a tackle shop. Yeah. He had a nice yeah. boat. He, he, was, mm -hmm. he was a very jovial, like, like Tony said, Larry did was he, a very. Did he go to Givens? No, he went to St. Thomas. St. Thomas. Yeah. St. Thomas. But he was yeah. very happy. He had his Jeep. He, he fished. He had His dad had a tackle shop. He yeah. had, uh, you know what I mean? Went to FSU. He had he lots had, of he, you know, smoking hot girlfriends. Like, he was yeah. that guy. He was the guy we always wanted. We all wanted to be, you know? Right. Super popular. Super popular guy. So when this experience took place, I don't think he, you know, and this is just my opinion, I don't think he, um, he really learned how to, I don't think he really knew how to process what had happened afterwards. And keep in mind, he spent, after the hijacking, he spent, and I'll just throw a couple little tidbits out there to explain his trauma, he spent the night, although he was not handcuffed, he spent the night in a jail cell with these two guys after they caught them, right? They, after these in guys Kat were Key. caught in Cat Key, because there is no real holding facility in Cat Key, and the, the, the uh, security guard and the customs officer who had heard the story and were on Larry's side, they knew this was the truth, they had nowhere else to keep everybody together. So Larry actually had to spend a night in the in a jail cell with somebody what? who literally was about to take his life. With they two guys. Were, they yeah. were in tie wraps, right? Yeah. So they were yeah. somewhat separated, but they were in the same jail cell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You kidding me? Yeah, there's a lot of details like this in the book that you just right. gotta read. Yeah, like, no, I can't, yeah, I can't for cover sure. it. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's I, crazy. I throw that out there because they told him they knew where his girlfriend lived and gave him gave him the address in the jail cell. They told him where his mother lived, which was a few blocks away from her. They told him the Jeep he drove, which I actually owned at the time, and like or actually it was I was driving it, but they 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 had done their homework on him. So he was terrified, especially somebody who had never really. They knew about yeah. his mortgage. He had just got yeah. first, his he first had mortgage. Just gotten his first mortgage on oh, a house, wow. by a condo, and uh, they had done some some serious homework on him. Uh, not so much me. They didn't know so much about me, but um, they 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 were more con thanks, dude. They were more uh, concerned with him. Right. And so so just sitting there. I look back at that night, and I mean, thank God it was him in that cell with them versus me, because <laughs> I probably would be still living in <laughs> Box Hill Prison today, oh, wow. you know. But but um um you know unfortunately that that took its toll on Larry afterwards. Um, <clears throat> Larry died in two thousand and one um, from complications from a long a long road of in two thousand one. In two thousand one. Yeah. Yeah. So not that, so not that he long after. He, he didn't. It was six. It was it was basically six years later, and um he he passed away from. Uh, complications with dealing with his demons and i'm just going to say it like that okay. because I, this book is dedicated to larry okay gotcha. and, it's, and it's also dedicated to anybody who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder this is my focus and it has always been my focus to dedicate this book to larry mm -hmm. thank you larry saved my life that night and um i'm forever grateful for him his fast thinking i'm forever grateful for all the things he taught me about fishing boating and uh you know, this is this is my way Crazy of honoring to him. And just his spirit, his, his spirit, energy. Yeah, he's he an amazing was, guy. I mean, I love that that picture of him shaving a mohawk of you. That, yeah, that yeah. you know, you guys were just and you, these guys were like brothers. Yeah. I, I want to let you know they were so tight. They were like brothers. Yeah, and I met Larry. I met Larry at a very 
we were thrown together. He didn't hire me. The, the boss actually hired me. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to touch on this. This is, again, you know, people are different. And, but two people can become the best of friends that are from completely different backgrounds, completely different personalities. I met Larry when I was about, uh, I think I was 20 when I met him. And I'd already traveled around the Caribbean. And I had a good resume. I had fished in Venezuela and Mexico and St. Thomas and all around. <clears throat> and I met Larry. And the boss hired me without really consulting Larry. And when I met Larry, you know, the first time I met him, he's wearing like, you know, $200 set of uh, Sperry Top Sider Lounge Lizard Skin Top Siders, mm -hmm, yeah. okay, with like a Oh, pink... like uh, Randy Strauss? Yeah, uh, serious. Yeah, yeah. Serious. Yeah. serious. This guy, this yeah. guy was such a, this guy was such a fashion diva. It's not even funny. Like Ralph, Ralph Lauren, you know, yeah. he's got like, you know he Randy? did not. Huh? You know Randy? Which Randy, Randy Strauss? No. He's a commissioner uh, in Largo by the Sea. No. I fished with him in Australia with Peter Wright. His gotcha. dad was a famous uh, chiropractor, uh, Dr. Strauss. He was a legend in chiropractic. Anyway, he used to make these shoes. Uh, like, oh, yeah, like, like lizard skin shoes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah so, so Larry, as a fisherman, is rocking these things. I'm like, wow, man, this guy's like, this is not... This guy doesn't even fish. You know, I didn't know who he was. And like, we're shooting pool. I'm dressed in black with my sleeves rolled up, you know. And he looks like something out of a GQ magazine, you know. Right. And he smokes me in a pool game. And I used to play this seven nights a week. Like, smokes me, right? And I'm like, okay. All right, a little bit of respect. And then we just, from that day on, we became such close friends, right? Like, I realized he had a great reputation as a fisherman. And more importantly... I was at that transitional state in my life, phase in my life, where I didn't know, really know what I liked. I didn't know what my style was. I didn't know what kind of music I really liked. He was super, and still is to this day, super influential with all of that, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm very grateful. So so we had a, a Larry a was in the death metal? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no he's, he was more in the Sisters of Mercy. I, and know, like, uh, I know you were a death, and, uh, you were a death metal guy back, back in, then. Yeah, not so much. Yeah, I mean, Metallica, whatever. But, but he got me into, like, all the progressive new music and, like, mm -hmm. you know... Uh, he was like a big brother. He expanded yeah, your horizons. Yeah, I he have an older brother. Yeah, he was definitely, at the time, much closer to me than my actual older brother was, although he and I are super close. But, um, right. yeah, so he definitely opened my my eyes to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of partying back then. He lived life big. I mean, he did not worry about tomorrow. He worried about tonight, you know, and right. that was... Uh, that was Larry and people, you know, nice. everybody knew him. It was I cool. had a lot of good times and, with Larry. Let yeah, me tell you amazing that. Dude. And so, so he's, you say he's worried about tonight, worried about tonight. So he jumps in the water to save you. So here you are yeah. up on the rocks. Yeah, so he's there sitting in the water still. So, yeah. So he is getting swept out to the West. Back to the story. He's getting and swept you, to the you West. you still have no idea where he is. Have no idea where he is, right? And you I think there's a possibility he could be alive now. Yeah. The, like a, a, coming back to the white flares, like everything happens for a reason, right? I believe that he was still alive. I I didn't I was not thinking he was dead because I'd seen these flares. Right. Again, I didn't know those flares weren't him. I assumed they were, and there was some relief when I turned the boat away from where these flares were going off because I felt like, okay, he's going to make it. You know, that's him and he's going to make it. What was confusing me was the flares were ahead of the boat and I had no I knew I'd come from the south. So the the, the compass, my compass is all messed up from where I'm seeing these flares, from where the boat was, from where it's coming. Understandably. From understandably. Yeah, understandably. I'm, I'm super disoriented. And yeah. it's dark. It's pitch black. Right. And it's cold. It's cold. It's about... Yeah, that November. Night. It's yeah, in November, It was right? November 18th, and it was I think it was 67 degrees that night, right? So there's a lot of details to that night that I remember that are in the book, which are interesting little details about things going on outside of the story. Um, that being said, so I run the boat aground hard. The guy... The hijacker standing next to me, and he actually hits the windshield of the boat, which took a, it, the boat stopped cold. Boom! Right, a crunching stop, propellers out of the water. The guy had hit the windshield. He had fallen into the windshield and actually cracked the windshield on a sixty-five hatter. So that's how hard we had hit. And he was freaking out on me, right, screaming at me. And I remember pulling, like I said, I pulled the boat out of gear and then I put it back in gear, and I heard the propeller do this million samurai sword thing and watched all this water just fly for like 100 feet which is like this is something <laughs> it's like a big rooster tail like yeah. a rooster tail but it was sideways and i, oh, I mean wow. you can't even you can't i mean no this, one's ever seen anything like that and i never will again you know it's yeah. sounds and things that i have never seen and never will see again i guarantee you that you know so he's screaming at me he's like get this boat off the rocks now he's getting extremely violent he's hit me a couple times he's pushing me and i'm like okay so the quick plan i can come up with is going to the engine room and see if i can get the, the motor that was shut off originally from running aground back started, which is the starboard side, right? So 
I go starboard's in the water. Starboard's in the water, and the boat's keeled over, kind of not all the way on the chine, but pretty far over. It's on the keel. Okay. Right? And the port was the motor that was working, but it was out right. of the but, but it's the out prop of the water. was out of the water. Yeah. The pickups were in the water, right. and that por- and that motor was still running. I actually, so I'll, I'll get to this part of the story. So I go down into the engine as I'm coming down the ladder off the bridge. The little guy who was inside, who had been watching me originally. He's panicked. He flies outside, okay, and he's screaming in Spanish, and they're having their conversation in Spanish. Well, the boat was keeled over to the starboard side, and the boat had big scuppers. And what happened was, because it was an outgoing tide, and I think it was a northeast wind that night, um, the water is getting pushed up the scupper. It's getting pushed backwards up the scupper on the low side of the boat. Mm -hmm. So the cockpit's actually filling up with water, but not to where we're sinking because we're hard aground, right? Right. But the water's coming in through the scupper because there's it's a one way. It's there's not a one way valve on it. So and no matter what, you never want water in the cockpit. You don't like want it, water you, in the cockpit. Yeah. But it was a good diversion because the little guy saw the water coming into the cockpit, and he asked me as I was coming down the ladder, "We're sinking, we're sinking." I'm like, "Yeah, we're sinking." Yeah, and I right. needed I needed to divert him. I knew we weren't because we were hard aground. Yeah. And I said, "Listen, pull those hatches up in the lazarette. Pull the hatches up in the cockpit and tell me if there's any water." I you know. I, rock, whatever, you know? Right. I figured there was going to be water in there just to keep him busy because... I was I mean, going to say, then you kicked him in. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to... We'll get to that part yeah. in a second. So... I think you're trying to buy yourself time I'm trying to, to I'm trying to think. Buy yourself, yeah, That's yeah. That's all it is. Seconds are like hours at this point, right? Seconds are like hours. And so I come down the ladder and I go into the engine room. The guy with the gun comes down the ladder behind me, okay? Keep in mind, I still have the shackles on and I'm going down a ladder and down a ladder of an engine room, okay? Yeah. So I go into the engine room, and I can see on there's two engine control boxes. I can see the lights on the uh, starboard engine are lit, like on the it's shut off, right? So it's alarms going off, and the port motor's still idling. Okay, so as I come down and I look in the engine room, I turn around and look, and the the guy with the gun has come down into the engine room with me, but his head is turned and he's talking to his buddy in the cockpit, the other guy in the cockpit. And they're having a conversation in Spanish, but he's kind of watching me with the gun. The gun's about that far away. The little guy or the big guy? The big guy, right? He's the only one that had the gun. So he's got the gun on me like this. And I actually, the first thing I saw when I went into the engine room was a set of bolt cutters that I would carry right at the uh, engine room hatch in case I ever got a hook in my hand or somebody got a hook in them. We had a a set of, I was always taught Mm -hmm. to keep a a set of bolt cutters handy. Well, on impact, those bolt cutters actually had slid out into the the companionway in the engine room. And I actually saw them on the ground. And they were a big set of bolt cutters. And I remember turning, I remember looking at the bolt cutters and then looking back at him. And the gun was about that far away from my head. And I remember, like, thinking, like, man, I could knock, maybe I could knock the gun out of his hand if I picked it up and, like, hit him with it. And then I totally chickened out, right? I'm like, it's just something said, too close quarters, right? Probably the right move. Probably it was the right move because I'm still yeah. standing here, right? Yeah, so, that's what I mean. You know. Right, it's definitely the right move. Yeah. That was that was that was survival instinct. Exactly, but but that that little that little detail is going to play into it in a second. So, so he comes down to the engine room with me and he's screaming at me because the engine's still idling, right? So I actually talk him into very carefully with the gun in my face at close range. I say, "Hey, man, listen, this this engine's running. It's not doing any good because the propeller's out of the water." I said, "Do me a favor." I said, let me shut this engine off so I can talk to you. I can start it again. And he's like, okay. So I shut the engine off on the local control panel. And I'm like, okay, now I can, I'm relieved because I can talk at a normal level. And at this point, I have no plan. I don't know how to fix the engine that's shut off. I don't know how to reset it. You're in the engine room. I'm in the engine room, yeah. Okay. I'm clearing this, right? So, so I'm still in the engine room. And I said to him, I'm trying to get, number one, I'm trying to get away from him because that's my natural instinct is to get away from the danger. Number two, I'm trying to buy time. Again, seconds are like hours at this point. So I said to him, I said, listen, I need to crawl behind the engine. And I'm just trying to put distance between me and him because he's on top of me like this. I said, I need to crawl behind the engine and I need to get over the stringers. I said, so I can't do it with these shackles on. In that moment, I realized that there was, I was going to have to swim. No matter what, I was going to have to swim on this night because this boat is not coming off the reef. And I need to get these shackles off. It was right. very quick thinking, but it wasn't, it was just like, I, I can't say I really planned it like that, right? And he agreed. So he takes me back into the cockpit and he takes the shackles off. Okay. He takes, he takes the shackles completely off of me and I go back into the engine room. And I remember feeling like, wow, man, I can't believe you just did that. Right. I'm cool. 
I can I can get away from this guy, right? But I'm thinking on the other hand, like you've been so cooperative with him up until this point. Yeah, he's probably thinking this guy's not going to do anything. Yeah, I, and I was because I, mean? I was yeah. scared shit. But he's still I mean, a yeah. big guy. Yeah, so, but but so I mean, he's... but this he's still his only hope. You know, because these right. guys these guys don't know nearly as much about the situation as you do right, right now, and they don't know that you know a lot about it. Right. You know what I mean? So they probably think still this is the only guy that can save us. All right, whatever. You know right. what I mean, he's been cooperative. That's probably why they did it. Would you would, agree would, with that? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I was, I was, the, the, the tone and the, the, the speed that I was speaking mm-hmm. was very calm. Maybe the calmest ever of my life That's what at that saved point. You. Yeah, I kept it. Re- as he got flared up. Like, I would just keep getting calmer and calmer. And people who know me know that's not really my natural <laughs> no. nature, right? But, I mean, I've served it. It served me well. Again, it's something I learned that night. So so I actually am just trying to put distance between myself and him. And I said, listen, I have to crawl around the outside of this engine to try and fix it. And I remember um, crawling back. And he, he took, the, like I said, he took the shackles off in the cockpit. I went back in the engine room. And I crawled behind the back of the, the starboard motor. And I remember sitting there. Literally, like, looking at an exhaust manifold bolt and literally turning it, in, like, turning my finger around it like this. It wasn't loose. I was just, like, looking busy. Mm-hmm. And I remember just thinking, oh, my God. Like, it was, I'm not kidding you, that was the longest few seconds of my life. I'm like, right. I have no plan. No plan. I don't know what I am going to do this boat. I know I'm in shallow water. I'd seen the rocks when I came off the bridge. I knew on the low side of the boat, it was so shallow. If I jumped off the bridge, it was death, right? There's no, it's a 12 foot drop jumping out the yeah. coral head. Like there was no, there was and there's no, no way. tide scenario really in that, in Th- that. There South was, there was, it was an outgoing tide and I'll get to that. I'll okay. get to that in a second. So, so it was an outgoing tide, but it was lowing. It was dropping, right? So the tide is falling for sure. hundred okay. percent. So I know there's, I'm going to have to swim, but I don't know how I'm getting off this boat and I'm not going to be able to jump from the bridge. And I remember just sitting on the, behind that engine for as long as I could just, I remember t- I took a couple deep breaths and I just, I'm like, I could not come up with an idea. I could not come up with a plan. My, I was like kind of relieved that I was away from him and he, I was kind of hiding from him in the engine room. Cause these were a big set of MTU motors and he's like, hurry up. And he's yelling. But I remember like I pushed him right to the limit to where he started screaming at me to come from behind the engine. And I remember like, I still got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. Oh and, I, and and all I came up with at the last second was, I'm going to go to the bridge. And keep in mind, that boat had a full Isinglass enclosure. I'm just going to go to the bridge and just try to go right through the Isinglass. Like, I'm just going to just take a shot. For, and, like, I got nothing, right? So I go back up to the bridge, and I walk slowly. The little guy, the little guy, as I... Uh, as I come out of the, the engine room, little guy, he's got his head in the lazarette, and he's freaking out. Like He's like, there's water here, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. So and your distraction method worked. Yeah, it was, because he was still in there freaking out. He was freaking out, right? Like, the little guy and the two of them were having conversations. And um, so I go back up to the bridge, and both the lights, the stop engine lights are shut off, right? I can see the red lights lit. And I go up, and I'm thinking, no big deal. I'm going to hit the start, and at least I can stall him a second longer because the port motor is going to start because I shut it off manually, right? So I walk up, I walk up to the front uh, console on the boat, and I hit the start button on the port engine to, to kind of, you know, start it again, and I hear click. Oh. And I'm like, <laughs> it just got really bad, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, click, click, nothing, right? And you would assume that motor was going to start back Yeah, up. and I assumed it was going to start back, and at least it would, like... Can I ask you a question real yeah. quick? What, sure. time, what time is it right now? This right now is probably about 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Oh, so o'clock you still night. got the 10 whole o'clock. night to go. I still got a long way to There's go. no it's daylight really happening late. anytime yeah, soon. Yeah, no, this is early in the night, right? The time frame of the darkness of all this is really... Uh, it's kind of lost, because like I said... Seconds felt like hours, right? So my concept. Sure, of time, but I'm saying there, there's yeah, still a, there's still is, no there's that, no light coming. Daylight cannot be there's in your no plan. There's no daylight coming. It was, yeah. it was already dark when you approached Bimini. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it when was you were dark when we was, got to Bimini. Yeah. So they, before the whole thing even went dark. down, it was already dark. But it got dark early back then. It got darker yeah, it like six, yeah. this time of year. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So I remember having this the most sickening feeling ever when I hit that start button and it didn't start. Literally, like, I felt like the bottom of my stomach fell out. And I didn't want to turn around because I knew he was right behind me, right? And I remember it was a long second, and I turned around. 
he was standing at the top of the, the ladder, okay? And it's a long drop. It's about a eight-foot drop to the cockpit on those boats, right? They had high bridges. And then when I turned around, I'm all the way forward in the, uh, in the, in the, on, the, on the front console, and I remember turning around in the darkness and looking at him. He was probably from here to the wall away. And I remember looking at his feet and seeing his feet literally like that far away from the edge of the ladder, like where you'd step onto the ladder. And he had the gun under his arm and he had the GPS in his hand. And he Ooh. was and, and I could see the reflection. He was turned sideways to me. The gun was under his arm. I was standing ahead of him and he was trying to get his position. And I could see the reflection of the GPS in his glasses. And he was he was tapping on it. And I saw the gun tucked under his arm. And I want to be very careful how I tell this part of the story because I've told this, this, this part of the story for a long time that sounded really macho. I'm going to be 100% honest with you right now. This is how it went down. Okay. I realized he didn't see me when I turned around. And I had no plan. I had nothing. And I was in so much fear for my life that I actually wanted to check out. I would have, I, I, in that moment, I decided I'd rather be dead than here. There was no macho in me. I felt like a complete chicken because I told you about the bolt cutters. I felt like I had missed that opportunity in that moment. I felt like, man, I missed my shot. I could have done something. And now you just got to go. You're going to die. Like this, death is better than this anxiety. You thought that your best chance had already passed you by exactly i felt like if i ever felt like a failure in my life it was in that moment and i was like you failed and little did i know (laughs) there was going to be some more of that coming (laughs) but so i said to myself i'm just going to take my chances on this right here i'm done i this is not an i want to be very clear this is not an act of machismo or tough guy or anything this is i want out of here period last resort this is last resort right i I don't care about, I am not attached to the outcome of this because I don't want to be here anymore. So I come charging at him, okay? And I, he's my size. I'm at full cock coming at him as fast as I can. And my, my only plan was to knock him off the ladder and whatever, and probably go off with him. And he was a step down on the ladder, He was, right? yeah, he had like one foot on the step, if I remember. Yeah, it was like one bridge. Step. He was, he, yeah, he's like right at the step. I remember his foot being like that far away from the edge and he's in the companionway of the ladder. So as he, he sees me at the last second, drops the GPS, grabs the gun, and I connect with him right in the side of the head, right? As he's going down, he grabbed the rail, and he pulled the first round off about that close to my head with a Mac 11. So what was not a silencer, <laughs> which was a barrel extension. Oh, that's not oh, a silencer. Yeah, that's not a silencer. <laughs> kind of wish it was. That's when you found out, right? Yeah. So I... Wow. The, the muzzle flash closes. Found out the hard way. Yeah. The muzzle flash closes my eye from, the, from a burn, and I literally have a concussion from an explosion going off next to a 380 going off next to my head at point blank range. That round actually, at the angle it was at, actually went through the soft top uh, on the, on the, the roof. And, of and you had scars, burn scars yeah, on burns the side my, of your yeah, face. Yeah, Years eyeball, later, when we worked together, you still had the burn scar. Yeah. Yeah. It burned. Like I had it muzzle, was just flash. Like muzzle flash and shrapnel or whatever. My eye was shut. So I'm kind of blind and deaf, and I'm kind of I could see out of one eye, and we're just going at it, right? And you so, went all the way down. You fell, right? Yeah. So I'm on top oh, so of. So you them. guys fell from the bridge? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So if you look at the pictures that are on the internet, you'll see a canvas overhang um, that hung off the the back of the bridge. It's actually ripped all the way down because we were actually fighting on part of the canvas, which it's amazing. So they it fell held ten feet. You fell what? Ten feet? Eight no, no, feet? we didn't. No, 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 no. We were still on the bridge. Oh, okay. Let me, let me tell okay. the story. Okay. <laughs> right. So we're on, we're on the bridge, right. And the, the canvas is getting toward and we're going at it. My goal at this point is to get my hand on the gun. Right. So the gun comes up in my face like this and I grab his hand as the gun is coming back to my face and I pull his hand to the right like this and he squeezes off the second round which actually went through the rocket launcher belly band on the bridge. That bullet hole is actually still in the rod holder on the boat to this day, right? It went right through, went clean through because it was a full metal jacket 380 and it went clean through the aluminum rod holder, right? So at that point, I got my, I have my hand on the gun and I remember like, I think I tried to smash it on the uh, stanchion that was right there on the, uh, on the uh, belly band and he pulled the gun underneath him and rolled back into me, right? So I'm on his back and I'm punching in him, and I, I have one hand on the gun, 
underneath and I'm like trying to twist the gun literally to shoot him. And right about that time, he squeezes off another round, which really startled me. Keep in mind this whole time because of the muzzle flash in my, I think I'm shot in the head. I th- and I remember saying to myself during this fight, I can't believe I'm still moving, right? I'm shot because right. the- I, all I can see is a white light, a concussion, and I feel a lot of pain. And I figure I'm shot, but I'm going to keep going, right? So I get my hand on the gun a, th- a, th- a third time underneath him. He roll- we're rolling the gun. I'm literally trying to roll the gun to him. And his finger is on the trigger. I actually remember feeling the trigger at one point, and that kind of inspired me to go a little harder. And then he put his hand on top of the trigger and pulled off two more rounds that went through the deck underneath him. So he was literally laying on top of the gun and squeezed it, and we both squeezed the trigger at the same time, right? One of those rounds I, I still have to this day that was cut out of the deck by Phil Vitale at, at Allied Marine. I, wow. owned, I owned the bullet with my name on it, right? Yeah. So and it had your name on it. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I was going to get that one, right? So at that point, I'm like, I'm kind of in an awkward situation because we're on the edge of the bridge, and I can't really get a good hit on this guy and I'm trying not to let go of the gun. I'm yeah, trying to you get, don't want to let go of that gun. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. I'm getting I actually got closer to him and tried to get my right hand underneath him to get both my hands on the gun. And as I went to do that, he rolled over and threw an elbow that caught me right between the eyes. And when I tell you that is the hardest hit I have ever sustained in my life. I've been hit hard a few times, right? And I remember just my sinuses literally like if it was an inch lower, it would have broken my nose. And stars, uh, huh? Yeah, no, and it was stars and sinuses just like dumping, like cleared. And I from the from the con- I already had a concussion of some sort, I would imagine, right? That just completely all I saw was white and stars and like you said, like I don't even remember really what happened next. But I do remember because the boat was keeled over I rolled over, uh, I rolled off of him. And the next thing I remember, because my ears were ringing from all the gun gunfire, I remember seeing him on his knees. And I was on my knees. And he had the gun to my head like this, and he was screaming at me. And my last thought at that point was, okay. I was very calm. I didn't feel the panic I had felt before. And I was like, here it comes. And I do remember saying, you failed again. I do remember saying that to myself, like, you failed, here it comes. You kind of deserve it, you know? And it's interesting, I I bring that up because in my life today, I don't believe in failure. Mm -hmm. You either succeed or you learn. There's no such thing as failure, right? And just because you think you failed, you don't. That's strong. I'm sitting here today, was I a failure that night? Not in my book, right? Like, no, no, it took me years to figure that out, right? So I'm at the point, like, looking down the barrel of this gun again, and I'm like, all right, here we, here we go, relief, right? And the little guy downstairs starts screaming at him because he was about to pull the trigger. There is no doubt in my mind that I feel he was about to pull the trigger. I felt like he was angry. He was hurt. We were, we were fighting. He was, I saw the look in his eye. He was about to do it. And the guy downstairs literally screamed at him and said, don't do it in Spanish. Don't kill him. We need don't him. Don't do it. We're, we're, he said we're screwed. Don't do it. Yeah. And, and he, he said something, I, I want to say he said something about, you know, like murder or something. I, I can't remember exactly what he said because I was, couldn't hear very well. So he's thinking. He's caught. He was thinking he was caught. Yeah, why add a murder charge Exa- to it? Exactly. The little guy's thinking. Exactly. Why add a murder? Let's get back to Larry's story real quick, and we're going to wrap this part of, uh, of it up mm-hmm. here. So, so Larry is in the water, sees the boat turn towards before I run aground, sees the boat and the lights run towards us, and come towards him and then sees me run aground and hears it and sees, because the boat keeled over, sees the running lights actually at an angle. So in his mind, he's in the water, and he is exhausted. He's a ways away. He's probably a mile offshore of this, maybe. We we tried to estimate it three-quarters of a mile a mile um, just because of the time, speed, current, and distance. We tried to work it out after this experience. But what he thought at the time was the boat was sinking, because he could only see the lights, and the lights were crooked, so he thought the boat was sinking. Yeah. And um, he actually started swimming again. He was... Go How ahead. were the seas? The seas were fairly calm. It was, okay. it was fairly calm. It was a northeast wind, but it was fairly calm, because remember, that's... Blowing I'm assuming off. it couldn't have been too rough. It wasn't with, rough, because, it, because on, it was but... a northeast wind yeah. that night, and what happened was, you know, it would have been blowing... It was flat, close to shore, okay. on that side. It would have been rough on this side, flat on that side. Gotcha. Right? So, 
Larry is getting eaten by jellyfish. He's feeling stuff rub up against him. He swears he got bumped by something that and, I and remember. The, Go ahead. Um, from my talking with Larry after this, at that point when he heard the guns go off. Yeah, I'm getting to that right now. Okay. So, so time passes, and he hears the four shots go off, as Johnny was bringing up. And he actually said that's what inspired him to keep swimming, to mm-hmm. start swimming again, because he said he was done, right? He had, he had nothing, but he had taken his shirt off. He was wearing all white. He was wearing a white shirt that night and a tan pair of khakis. And he actually had kicked the shirt off. He had taken his shirt off in the water so he wouldn't be seen. He actually sunk the shirt so the guy, in case the guy was, you know, after he jumped in, wouldn't see him. And um, he heard— Probably the, a nice Tommy Hilfiger. Probably. <laughs> well, knowing him for sure. Right? Lizard, lizard yeah. shoes past the boat. Yeah, knowing him for sure, right? So— so uh, he, he hears the gunshots go off, and I talked to him. You talk, a lot of people talk to him. Um, that really had a profound effect on him. Number one, it inspired him to keep swimming. And number two, he often told me the guilt he felt yeah. when he heard those gunshots go off. Mm-hmm. Like, he, he felt like he had left me. Yeah. He felt like, oh, my God, I made the biggest mistake in my world. Tiny was still alive, right? Yeah. So. So at this time, he thinks I'm dead. So he's right. imagine the emotion he's going through. Not only that, but he's a mile offshore in the Gulf Stream swim, trying to swim in the dark to Cat Key. He thinks he you fucked know? up. He thinks he screwed up. He thinks yeah. he fucked up and got so, a tiny kill. Yeah. Yeah. He jumped off because he thought you were dead. Mm-hmm. Right. And then okay. comes the reality that. But but the reality the is that he saved by doing. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. The gun, the gun, the, the gravity of hearing the gunshots kicks in and the self-doubt kicks in for him. Right. Yeah. That never really left him. Yeah. He apologized for right. that hundreds of times to me mm-hmm. to a point where especially you know when we were out drinking or doing our thing after all this it, it, i said dude you saved my life that night yeah. he never even when i said it to him he never many got times, over it. he never he never i don't feel he ever really got over it you know mm-hmm. i saw i always saw him as a hero and other people had their own ideas of what happened and this story and there was a there was a lots of hearsay and lot you know you tell a story to a fisherman and it changes right. yeah a hundred li- times especially later especially in know? the bubble yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, and uh, but but really and truly, he was a hero. He saved my life that night. His quick thinking got me to a point where um, I all this I just told you could happen. If you it know, wasn't re- the him. reality is, is the only one's opinion on that matter that matters is yours. That's it. That's it. That's all. That it matters. was your life at the end of the day. That that's it. If I have any regrets about the story, it's maybe I didn't convey my appreciation to Larry enough. Although I told him thank you. you I don't. Did. I don't think you there did. was enough. I don't think there was enough. I couldn't say it enough times how grateful I was to him, you know. And he felt like he left me down, but he was the last person on earth that would ever let me down, you know, yeah. at that time. That that I knew. I don't think he knew that, but I knew that. You know? He was yeah. second guessing his decision. Yeah, absolutely. He was second guessing mm-hmm. his decision. Yeah, for sure. Point. All right, so we're all waiting with bated breath because there's a gun pointed to your head right now. Right. So, so <laughs> exactly right. So uh, yeah. So so where are we at? So so yeah. There's a gun pointed at my head and. The little guy's the guy, screaming the not guy to kill you. The little guy screams not to do it, and the big guy goes downstairs. He actually goes downstairs, and they have another conversation. Okay, the boat's keeled over, and the little guy comes upstairs, and this was really a scary part of the night, and he takes the handcuff that is loose, and he clips it onto the starboard side tower ladder, okay, at about chest height, which is the ladder, the outboard the outside ladder going up to the tower on the low side of the boat, okay? He clips on the bridge or on the... On the bridge, okay. on the flybridge, right? So I'm on the flybridge, starboard side of the flybridge. He clips the, the handcuff around the ladder wrong, okay? <laughs> Just want to make a quick note of this. So this was not, a, again, I said, said this earlier, it was not a stainless steel police handcuff. It was actually a pot metal handcuff that came from Miami Police Supply that cost eleven ninety five. I know because I found a package on the boat after the hijacking with the price tag on it, right? Just a little piece of trivia for you but i'll get to that in a second he puts the stainless leg shackles back on me tight as hell and i'm standing there handcuffed to the low side of the the bridge on the ladder like this he asked me he looked at me dead in the eye and he said i'm sorry he actually apologized the little guy or the little guy guy. and i'm like really that was really the most terrifying point up until that point more so the big guys in the cabin big guys downstairs inside the inside the salon okay and the lights are off. And he said, I'm sorry. And he apologized a couple times. But he apologized in a way like he was about to kill me. Right? right. So it's pretty scary. So I'm just standing there. And I'm like, man, I'm thinking all I could think at the time is like, man, I can't even, <laughs> I yeah. can't even eat a bullet when I want to properly right. at this right. point. Right. 
So I stand there and he asked me, he said, um, where is the life raft? And it was on the bridge and I showed him the compartment. It was actually right next to where I was. So he does that and he went up front and all the electronics were on. The Trimble nav graphics machine was on. The single sideband was on. Everything was on. And I knew that number one, I could, I knew how to turn on any of the other electronics, but because the Trimble was an old unit, we'd have to leave it on all the time for it to dry out because it would get moisture in it. Right. So I actually did not know how, thank God, I did not know how to turn that, that, that GPS off. And I got him to turn everything else off, but he said, how do you turn this one off? Which was actually the brightest screen on the bridge. I said, I don't know. But I also knew that had my longitude latitude in it. It was kind of a blessing. So he comes back. He carries the, uh, the life raft downstairs in a valise. It wasn't a hard mount. It was in a, it was in a bag, of valise. And uh, he carries it down, struggles down the ladder with it. And I remember seeing the big guy come out, and he had a notebook. It was in the dark. There was, there, there was only a little bit of light in the salon, and I could see but I couldn't see the, the cockpit lit up. And he actually tore a bunch of pages out of a notebook and was throwing them in the water. And he threw a bunch of objects in the water. Um, what those objects turned out to be was it was like a switch baton that we recovered. It was actually the barrel extension for the gun he threw in the water. He left the gun actually on the fighting chair. But because it was a dark green fighting chair, I never saw it from the bridge. I, ne- I must have walked by it a couple times. I never even saw it. And I'll get to that in a minute. He left the gun on the fighting chair, and um, he threw a bunch of evidence in the water that had was recovered later after mm-hmm. the hijacking. So he goes, the big guy goes inside. The little guy takes the life raft um, downstairs, and um, the big guy comes out. I, he had a backpack with him. Um, big guy grabs the life raft, throws it overboard, gets in the water, like waist-deep water, like chest-deep water. Wa- I remember watching him. I'm still standing on the bridge. I remember watching him uh, walk the life raft out, maybe like 20 or 30 feet, and he pulled the he pulled the uh, trigger on the life raft. And man, that's a horrible sound too. My, mm-hmm. and maybe it just sounded that way because my nerves are just <laughs> so shot at this You're point. Like, I'm, right. deaf, I'm just like I'm I'm, I'm shell shocked. Shell shock, you know? yeah, yeah, that's so, a great word. Yeah. So he inflates the life raft. He gets in it. He has a flashlight. He's got a backpack. Little guy comes out, and the little guy was actually had somewhere in this in this evening had actually put on one of Larry's polo jackets. Like Larry's favorite polo yeah. jacket. It was a tan and red polo jacket. And I'll never forget. It's a little detail. And he puts it on. And um, and and actually, before he got in the water, he took it off and just dropped it where the scupper was. Like, and I was like, oh, I remember looking at it going, hmm, huh, right? And he gets in the water. They go out. They get in the life raft. And they start drifting out in the current. They start. They weren't. They didn't have paddles or anything. So the current's just taking them away up the starboard side of the boat towards the west. And I remember standing there. And, I, and they were shining the light on the boat. They're shining the, the the light on me to see if I was moving around. And I remember thinking like, again, oh God, here we go. I'm going to get shot. Right. So I kind of ducked down and where I was in relation to the bridge is there's the starboard side tower ladder. And then there's a bench seat literally right behind me. Right. So there's a bench seat and a little uh, compartment where the life raft was. So you could watch your baits backwards or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I remember thinking, okay, I have nothing to lose. They're going to shoot at me. Let me get as low as I can. So I actually get down super low, and I'm up against the wing of the, the bridge, you know, the house. And I remember sitting on the bench seat and kind of sliding off the seat going, oh, God, like, is this ever going to end? Like, the fear of getting shot again has come up for, like, the dozenth time, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I remember just sitting there, and I could see the lights flickering, and I could see the the uh, the, uh, the, the reflection of the flashlight flickering on the ceiling. And finally, the flashlight went out. Like, I sat there for, like, 10 or 15 minutes. And I couldn't see the flashlight anymore. I couldn't see the reflection. I looked, and I remember I could see the silhouette of life raft pretty far away. And I'm like, okay. Whew. Like, right. first deep breath for the night, right? Like, oh, my God. I just survived that. And I remember sitting there perfectly content with, I'm just going to sit here until morning, right? Somebody's going to find me. I'm close. Whew. Thank God, right? I cannot believe that just happened. And right about that time, that thought crossed my mind. The boat, because the tide was going out, the boat keels completely over onto the chine. Come on! It yeah. rolls like six feet to where it goes from. <laughs> it goes from the, the coral head must have broken. What? The tide drop, and the boat. And I'm on the low side, and you can see the pictures. It's all. It's on. Yeah. The, it's on the Gun Key book Facebook right. page. The boat rolls completely over onto the chine, and it's just like, and I'm completely sideways, and I'm like full-on coyote ugly fear right i'm like wow 
I am going to drown attached. Right. This boat is going all the way over in the tide, and I am going to drown, and I'm handcuffed to this thing, right? So here's, After all that. After, after all, all that. After all that. Just got my first breath of, ah, oh, you know? Let's kick you so, in the balls again. Yeah, so this is when the panic really kicked in right. for me, okay? And I can tell you the panic, like, I have never experienced panic ever before or ever since then, but it was urgent, like, I've never experienced and I remember thinking the whole coyote theory, like I'm ripping my hand off to get off this boat, right? Mm -hmm. I don't care what I got to do. So what I did was I put both my legs up on the tower rung. My hand was handcuffed, one handcuff around the rung. I put both my legs on the, on the tower rung and literally lifted myself up, which is about 240, 250 at the time, off the bench seat, trying to literally, I remember licking my hand first to try to get it slippery enough to slip the handcuff off and that didn't work and then i just lifted myself up with all my body weight trying to break the chain on the handcuff what i actually did was cave in and actually put a slight bend in the tower wrong so that goes to tell you how much adrenaline wow. i had going there was not a big bend but you can imagine what it takes to bend a tower wrong right? right that's how much force and i did it like two or three times very very quickly right up until the point when i stopped which was my biggest mistake and my hand just literally, I still have the scars on my hand from it. Um, I literally, and you can still see the indentation, mm -hmm. my hand just exploded. Like, it literally just swelled Started to up. swell, yeah. It started to swell, which was even more panicking because I'm like, I'm never going to slip the handcuff off right. now, right? So I remember catching my breath after that and just excruciating pain, like pass out pain. And keep in mind, I'm still can't, can't see. You still got a concussion. You still, still got, got a concussion. Yeah. I still got a lot going on, right? I can't hear. I can't see. I'm just... Completely disoriented. Shell Not to shocks. mention you've been yeah. hitting the head with a gun ten times. Ten before times, that. Yeah, yeah. I got muzzle yeah. flash in his face. Yeah. You know, burnt up. Yeah, there's mean, a lot going on, and yeah. and this this is just a sheer miracle right here. What I'm about to tell you. So, I sit there and I actually started crying, mm -hmm. and I was crying from pain. I was crying from exhaustion. I was just crying from all of it. I remember just sitting there sobbing. Broke the down. Broke down, and the boat was definitely <clears throat> shifting. It was still moving. It was still kind of creaking and crawling and, and rolling over a little bit. And I'm just like, I'm like, dear God, I got to, I, I, this has to end. Like it seemed like the endless experience, right? I'm mm -hmm. like, this has to end, right? And I sat there and I caught my breath and I'm like, I got to get something. I don't know what, I just remember singing myself. That I don't remember what, I was just like, I got to get something. And I caught my breath and I calmed down a little bit and the boat kind of stopped shifting and I tried to like put the 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 the, the fear of the panic of oh, sorry, uh, the fear of the panic um, away mm -hmm. and compartmentalize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly, exactly right. Gotta. So so I actually I actually started looking around and I'm like I got to find something, and I looked up and I the outrigger spreader was right here, okay. So we'd just come out of the boatyard before this trip. We actually came from the boatyard onto this charter. And the last thing on the list of, of my duties to do in a boatyard, we had just rebuilt the outriggers with uh, uh, Bill Cox, the outrigger guy. And he had just taught me how to take apart and put together a set of outriggers. I'd never done it before. And when we put the outriggers back up, what happened was um, I had forgotten to tighten a spreader cable, and it was on my list, and it was the one closest to me. So I knew how the outriggers came apart, and I remember pulling the cable off and popping a spreader, just a spreader bar, clean mm -hmm. off. And I remember holding it, if you've ever held a spreader bar, it's a cheap piece of aluminum. It's yeah, light. Right. It's yeah. light, it's thin, it's whatever. And I remember looking at it going, well, it's something, but this is never going to work. And I put it between the ladder rung and the handcuff, and on the first try, stripped all the teeth off of the handcuff. Come on. I swear to God. If it was a uh, stainless steel pair of handcuffs, there's no way it would have worked. But because it would work, they were the 1195 pop handcuffs. metal handcuffs that they grabbed at last minute, or maybe that's all they had. Wow. Bro stripped every teeth off. And I remember just holding the spreader and looking at the, I wish I still had that spreader, but um, I remember looking at the handcuff like in shock. I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my God. Wow. Right? So. Are you look at, wow, all the. Oh, oh, yeah. The Moise, the what are you thinking stuff. right now? Moise, yeah. what are you thinking right now? I remember when he told me about the spreader. Yeah. And like, man, you're so lucky. Yeah. So <laughs> lucky. What are the, what? And I, rem I mean, I know you take the cable off. And you can just take spin that thing right out of yeah, there. Yeah, you just pull it. You just it pop comes it right off. out because yep. only the pressure's holding it in. The cable holds it on. Yep. And uh, but I mean, what are the chances that that's the only loose, loose one, one, closest one to you, and cheap handcuffs? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the worst thing is that was the only that was number the last thing on my list. And I actually, 
it was the first time ever I was like, I'm going to scratch an entire list. <laughs> I got to yeah. put that note on there, wow. like in the boatyard. It was like Every, 250 things on my everything list. Everything happens for it, a reason. Goes, everything yeah. happens for a reason. So I'm free. I'm in absolute disbelief and shock. And I jump up off the bench seat and I ran over and I turned a single sideband radio on and I called the Coast Guard, Whiskey Charlie Charlie 2201. I can still remember the call sign today. And I called them and I called Coast Guard Group uh, Miami, right? I called Coast Guard Group Miami, but Fort Lauderdale picked it up. And I had <laughs> I had this rookie like radio handler. And I, 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 there's transcripts of this conversation the Coast yeah. Guard had. It was it was actually evidence in court. But this kid is asking me the dumbest questions. And I'm just like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm just like getting annoyed. And Coast Guard Group Miami actually picked up the call. And they said, we're going to get uh, a senior advisor here. And they brought somebody in who had... You know, they got a, a supervisor, and they came in and started talking to me, and he basically said, hey, listen, we, we have a cutter in the area. We're going to set a cutter for you. I gave him the longitude latitude off the Trimble, and uh, we're going to send a helicopter, and we have a cutter in the area for you. So just sit tight, you know, just sit tight and keep in touch with us if you need anything, whatever. We'll call you back. So <clears throat> at this point, I still have the shackles on, right, and they're killing me, and I can barely walk, right? So I go back down the ladder, I go back into the engine room to the bolt cutters that I could have used, and I cut the chain on the shackle with the bolt cutters in the engine room so I could walk, right? They were still very difficult because the shackles were so tight around my leg, it was cutting off the, the circulation. And those were stainless leg. steel. Those were stainless. Those were real police shackles, right? It took a lot to get through to cut the chain in the middle, right? So there was no chance of even cutting the shackle off my leg because they were that tight. So I get up and I go into the salon of the boat, <clears throat> And the Solano boat is just absolutely destroyed. One, from the ink impact. Two, from them ransacking it. Basically, they had this giant duffel bag that they'd brought on board. Mm -hmm. It was in the middle of the salon. They just, like, you know, like, rifled through it. I remember and, you telling me about the pasta or something. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a, there was a <laughs> gallon jug of ragu. <laughs> like a glass. What? Remember ragu, right? Yeah, remember yeah, it used yeah. to come in a gallon glass jar, right? So apparently this was up in the this was up in the in the Is that in, part in, of their provisions. I remember that they this part of the story. No, no, I wanna I, no, I, I can't remember if it was theirs or not. I don't remember. But it was in a cabinet in the galley and from the impact, the ragu literally like projectiled out of the <laughs> cabinet and exploded on the on the galley oh counter and then just like probably like, like blood all over the place. And it was it was a full on like like, like East Saint Laurent interior with all the logos and stuff, right? Hey, Ralph Lauren pillows and polo. And, and it was ragu just like, sauce. Just ragu. I like it looked like a murder scene from the ragu, right? And I was from the ragu. And, yeah, and I was slipping and sliding, and there's glass, and I can still smell the ragu. I've never eaten ragu since that day, right? So, so, oh my so god! I remember slipping and sliding because the boat's keeled over, you know. The generator was still running. And uh, I remember the generator being a, I had a dilemma because I'm like, do I shut the generator off because it's going to suck dry? Because keep in mind, I wasn't really mechanically that knowledgeable about systems and boats. And I remember knowing that the single sideband radio, my only form of communication, draws a lot of power. I did know that, right? Because mm -hmm. I used to get yelled at if I didn't turn it off when I was shamming or turn it on accidentally, whatever. So I made the decision to, I was worried about fire. I was worried about the sideband running out of juice. So I left it on. And I went downstairs, and um, I looked around. You know, the boat had been, like, completely ransacked, like, uh, ransacked. The, 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 the cruise quarters had been, like, there was clothes everywhere, our clothes. The, the mattresses had been flipped over. It just looked, the boat was a wreck, right? It was just completely a mess. And I went back upstairs um, to check on the Coast Guard. Like, I, I realized the boat wasn't shifting around much anymore, and I went back upstairs uh, onto the bridge, and I think I called the Coast Guard again. They're like, yeah, yeah, you know, we have a cutter coming. They're, they're, they're close to you, right? So I sat up on the bridge. You know, I don't, again, the time is hard to judge at this stage, right? But it's probably about an hour, 45 minutes. And this cutter, this small cutter, maybe like a 40-footer, makes its way through a uh, gun key cut. Mm -hmm. And I see him edging with a spotlight. And he didn't really shine the light on, on, on me. I was on the south side of the cut. But he was shining on the rocks to get through Gun Key, and uh, because you have to really hug those rocks to get in, so he comes around. Like a snake cut. Yeah, it's like it's like a little S turn you have to make in yeah. there. So he comes around, and um, and he and he, he keeps heading like south, right? He goes past me, okay. Um, so I called him. I called him on. I I called him on the radio, and he didn't come back to me, and I knew where the flare kit was. So I dug around on, on the bridge, and like the cushions were everywhere because of the impact and stuff. We actually had just made brand new bridge cushions. 
I found a flare kit, and in the flare kit um, was a handheld flare. Right, it wasn't a it wasn't a, a gun flare. Like a gun, yeah. yeah, but I'm like, you know, like that's a, all. Yeah, a pull one. Or? It wasn't a pull one. It was you're actually sit there and wave it. N- yeah, it was like a striker flare. It was a handheld striker. Like a roadside yeah. one that you yeah. put. Yeah. yeah, note to oneself: don't ever right. write off a handheld flare on a boat. I'll tell you why. <laughs> so, so I, I'm sitting there like reading the instru- in, in the instructions with like one with good one eye. eye. Yeah, and I'm like, God, man. So I finally get this thing. I figured out, pow, like, you know, I set it off. And I'm standing between the sulfuric smoke and the sparks shooting out of it. Like, the cushions are on fire. The deck's getting <laughs> Oh, burned. my God. Like, I held it for, like, two seconds. So he, and I'm like, I'm like, hey. Like, he's, like, he's like Martin Short I'm on like, Captain oh Ron. Exactly. Yeah. So you, exactly. you almost die in a boat accident. You almost Blow get shot. A flare. Yeah. You almost drown. And now now you're almost going to burn yeah. yourself. Now yeah. flare is going to get him. So I literally, I'm close enough to the rocks. I actually wing, I throw the flare. And it just, like, goes out on the rocks. And I get back on the radio. I'm like, hey, do you see me? And they're like, yeah, I see you. We, you know, the Coast Guard comes back and he's like, yeah, we see you, Rapscallion. Just stand by. We're going we're gonna to be down here a little ways away from you. Yeah. The, the chopper uh, shows up right about this time. Mm-hmm. And the chopper is flying to the east of me. So I'm looking out the back of the boat. There's, the chopper's flying a grid Coast pattern. Guard chopper. Coast Guard chopper. It's a, it's a, it was a uh, Bell Jet Ranger, right? Shows up and it's flying this search grid pattern, like a mile away from me to the east. And I'm watching him. Right. And he's flying the search pattern. And I call the Coast Guard. I'm like, hey, do you see me? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We see you, man. I said, listen, are are you searching for the captain? Because you're in the wrong area. Because I knew we were not there. Mm -hmm. Okay. He was flying so far to the east over the bank that I knew we had, I knew from where I was at that point, because I obviously got my bearings, that he was looking in the wrong area. I said, hey, have you found the captain? Are you looking for the captain? They're like, no, be advised, Rapscallion. We have the captain. And I had given descriptions of Larry, his name, his birthday, all this stuff, right? right. We, we'd had a series of conversations that was all recorded. It's all in transcripts. And um, so I'm like, you're looking in the wrong area. He's like, no, be advised. Your captain is in Cat Key, and we also have two individuals in custody with him. So I'm like, okay, well, then are you coming to get me, you know? Right. This is so crazy. This is where it gets tricky, right? So there's a long pause, and the and – I want to say it was a cutter, calls me back and says, be advised, Rapscallion, do not move around the boat. The chopper flies over me at that point and then calls me again and says, do not move around the boat. At the time, he said, do not move around the boat. Do not touch anything you're not familiar with on the boat. I'm confused. The chopper had flown over me one time, like a, a broad pass. And I thought at the time that he saw the angle the boat was at, mm-hmm. right? And I, th- and I thought that maybe he thought from me walking around the boat was going to shift, the, bo- the boat was going to roll, which I was fearful of the whole night. So he makes a pass, and both of them are staying away from the boat. And I said, I don't quite understand. I've already moved around the boat, like I said. I've, you know, I cut the shackles off. And the chopper pilot comes back and says, be advised, Rapscallion, the two individuals we have in custody, we believe this is just a threat, but we believe that there's, there could possibly be explosives on the boat. And you can't make this up. Can I ask, can yeah. I, didn't they tell you at one point that if anyone got close to you, mm-hmm. they were going to blow the boat earlier? So this is what, let me, let, me, let me get to that. Okay. Larry and the two guys are in custody in Khaki. Okay, there's a U.S. Customs officer there is the owner of Khaki, which is a whole other story that's in the book, which you can read about. The, hill, um, the guy that looked like from... Yeah, we're going to keep that right out of this conversation. Yeah, okay. So so they told them when they put them in the jail cell and they handcuffed them that if they were not released, they were going to blow the boat up, okay? Mm-hmm. So that there was explosives on the boat. And we're talking, this is before 9-11. This is before people right. even... So the Coast Guard didn't believe that, like, these threats were not taken seriously by the Coast Guard. And they, they reiterated that to me. I, I didn't feel comfortable, but I was like... I actually kind of panicked for a second. He's like, we think it's just a threat. These guys are just trying to get out of the situation they're in or whatever the terminology they used. It's in the transcript. It's in the book, right? So, so um, anyway, um, I thought about it for a second, and I said... I called the chopper pilot back. I said, I'm getting off this boat right now on the sideband. I said, I'm getting off this boat now. And they're like, can you swim? I'm like, yes. And he's like, he's like, well, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick you up. We need you to lower the antennas on the boat. And I'll never forget this. I'm like, the antennas? <laughs> I'm like, mister, this boat's got a 35-foot. I'm getting pissed, yeah. right? I'm like, it's right. got a 35-foot <laughs> tuna tower on it. You're going to make me do work here. Quote, unquote. Yeah. The antennas, no, the antennas are not going to make a difference. Yeah. And I'm thinking there's no way I could even crawl to the tower because the boat's at such an angle, right? Right. 
So I'm like, it has a 35 foot tuna tower on it. It's not going to make a difference, right? He's like, oh, okay, well, be advisor, Appscally, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick you in. A, we're going to pick you up about 100 yards in on Cat Key on the island to your port side. Can you can you swim? Can you walk? I'm like, yes, I will be there. He's like, he's like. Okay, so I hang up the microphone and I'm, wa- I'm, 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 I reach down and I grab a life vest out of the bench seat and I'm putting the life vest on and the, uh, the chopper pilot comes back on the radio and I was right about to go down the ladder and he says, do not touch the basket until it touches the ground, be advised. And he's like yelling this. So I actually went back to the radio and I said, you know, I, I didn't quite understand what he was saying. He said, do not touch the basket. And this is something good for your listeners to know if you're ever in a coast guard rescue situation and they drop that shopping cart basket down to get you out of the water or off of your boat do not touch it until it touches the water because the static electric I was shock say, it sounds will like kill you. an electricity situation it, yeah right? it's, it's a static yeah. electric shock that will actually kill you if you grab onto it i think there's probably some technology now that they don't have to worry about that anymore i'm not but, sure but yeah. back then back then like they were very adamant about it because wow. if you grab the basket you were done so at one that, more thing to kill you. Yeah, one more thing, right? So, <laughs> 10,000 ways to die. Choose yeah. one. Right? Wow. So, 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 uh, so I go downstairs with my, with my silly life vest on, and I jump off the low side of the boat right where the guys got off on the starboard corner. And um, I remember swimming around the back of the boat because uh, land was on the port side, right? So Cat Key was on the port side. So I have to swim that way. And I actually got sucked underneath the boat. And I remember looking up and seeing the propeller on the port side out of the water, and still intact. It was a three-blade Radici propeller, wow. Italian propeller. And I remember I was shocked that the propeller was still intact. Like, I couldn't believe it was still there, although I knew it was spinning. It was, right. I didn't think it was going to be there. So I get sucked underneath the boat, and I realize now I have to swim really hard. The shackles are still on my legs, but the chain is cut, and I don't have a lot of feeling in my legs. I have a lot of right. pins and needles. So Plus, whatever's on your feet when you're swimming is a lot heavier than you think it's going to be absolute, underwater. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Even like when you wear shoes and you try to swim with shoes on, it's, it, it, they'll weigh you down. It doesn't seem like they will, but they will. And he's in shock, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm in total shock, and I kept my shoes on. I actually remember thinking I'm going to have to walk over the coral because you could see the, you know, yeah. such shred, the coral rocks were right there. I knew I had to walk over that. So the chopper, the chopper is in about 100 yards on Cat Key hovering. And I, uh, I remember getting, I, by the time I got, I probably went maybe a hundred feet past the bow of the boat, trying to swim against the current, like the current, although I was swimming against it, I, I swam catty corner to it and finally got on the rocks and got shredded pretty good and cut up and, and, uh, crawled over the rocks. Cause they're really sharp. They're those, that tan mm-hmm. Bahama razor yeah. sharp rock. And, um, uh, so anyway, so I get over that kind of, you know, pick my way through that with a leg that's definitely can't feel anything. And, and, um. I run in towards, I walk, I didn't run, I walk towards the chopper, and I remember seeing him lower the basket, and um, uh, I get right up to the basket, I remember looking at it going, man, that thing is small, like, how am I going to fit in this thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I took off my life vest, and I, for some reason I remember this, I let go of it, I just threw it on the ground, and the chopper, I didn't feel the wind from the chopper blades, but I remember watching the the life vest literally just go like oh, over, really? over a tree line. I'm talking like, what? I'm talking like 50 yards away. Like it was yeah. like, like a Frisbee, you know? And I was like, cause he had the light shining and I was like, wow, that's crazy. So I get in the basket and you didn't touch the basket. Like I didn't touch did. the basket. Like I literally got up to it and I waited for the basket. He, he had that yeah. basket on the ground. It was hovering. And I yeah, made after sure. everything you've been through, like you're not, you're not going to yeah, just, just let that one take you yeah, out. Yeah, it totally, <laughs> totally echoed. Right. So I get in the basket and I'm squatted down, and I'm expecting, like, this nice, you know, like, uh, Disney World gondola ride or something. Like, he's going to lift me up to the to the door. Dude, I've seen videos, sometimes those things just, spinning. like, spinning like yeah. a fan. You, like, you yeah, lose this, your shit with that. This dude, because he had heard there was possible explosive, he was out of there. So he swings me literally <laughs> yeah. over the top of the boat, like, complete, like, I mean, he punches it. So you're swings, in the basket. I'm in the basket, and he does oh not lift God. me up in the basket. He swings me. Over the boat, and I'll never forget it. I wish I, I maybe one day I'll get you to commission a painting of this thing. But I could see the boat, I could see the top of the buggy top, and I could see the light on the water. I could see Gun Key Light in the background, and it was like a movie. I mean, it was. Li- I remember looking at the numbers. The whole story is like a movie. Yeah, I remember oh, looking yeah. at the, and, and this is only part of it. Like, there's a lot more to this that yeah. we're not going to get into. But so, so I remember looking at the bottom of the chopper and seeing the numbers on the bottom, thinking this is surreal. It was the most surreal moment of my life. Not like you didn't hear some already. Right. And he finally levels off somewhere over like Honeymoon Harbor to the east side. He levels off and starts lifting me up in a basket, right, which is probably about, I don't know, 75 feet, 50 feet, whatever. He lifts me up, and I get to, it's really unnerving feeling, I get to the top of the boom, 
And those chopper blades felt like they were literally on top of my head because you're higher than the door with yeah. a boom, right? And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm looking at this guy with this helmet and, the, you know, the, the flight crew guy, the door guy with a, with a flight helmet dressed in black. And he's like – trying to get the boat the the basket in the door and he <laughs> he reaches Boy, over man you can't pay for a ticket to a show like that yeah right so this is truly the most terrifying moment of the e of the evening the dude reaches over and he grabs this remote control that's on a cable and he like looks at me and he looks back at it and he goes Whoom, and he drops the basket drops slack in the basket like two feet just so he'd had enough slack to swim swing me in maybe three feet right. to get me to the edge of the door. Oh. And it was just like because the boom's out there. The so boom's you out come there, that right. way. Yeah, yeah. So you gotta drop me and ha has to have slack to get me in the door. And he dropped me like I don't know how many feet, but it was like, <gasps> like, like I mean, that was the most terrifying part of the whole night. Gets me, yeah, oh gets, my god. It's hard to say which is which one. There's a bunch of them, right? So, so he gets Maybe me. Maybe the gun to the head. That yeah, it could be. So but, but gunshots. Still, whatever. though, I mean, yeah. I mean, these things, so many moments in that night could have just, any one of them could have, like, And he could have gone into more detail. It's, it's, I could go. I'm sure, I I'm go. sure, but, yeah, but, so I mean. You can read it in a book, right? Yeah, so, yeah. book, yeah. So, so, uh, so I When's get, the book coming out? Hopefully, it's going to be done. It will be in print by the end of the year. It's been revised three times. It's with a book architect. I have an amazing writing coach named Rick Frischman mm -hmm. and another coach who owns a company called Author 101 University, who I'm forever indebted with because this book would not have happened without those guys. So okay. um, they are my coaches. They're super successful guys. Um, they've coached some huge people in life. They are they're amazing guys. And once yeah. they heard the story, they really took me on as a project. And their their goal, you know, they asked me, you know, why are you writing this book? And I said, because I think I have a really good story of survival to share with the world. And they said, oh, great, because everybody comes to us that wants to get rich. And as long as you, that's not your goal or make movies or do whatever everybody dreams about, then we will coach you because you have a message. Mm -hmm. You know, they both do amazing uh, philanthropic uh, work with the, with the environment, with the ozone layer. And they're not about, although they're super successful guys, they're about giving back mm -hmm. and... Uh, it's an amazing company that I'm affiliated with. Nice. Yeah, I, sorry, I got to give them a plug. That's no, please do. No, 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 we're all about the environment. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I can tell you, like these guys, if if anybody, everybody has a book inside of them, is what they've taught me. Everybody right. has a story. Everybody has a book, and we just sometimes. I'm not a writer. I'm a fisherman. Except, yeah. No, this guy's got the book of books yeah. right there, right? <laughs> but um, but anyway, so yeah, th those guys are amazing. And Andy's and, ready um, to kill me someday. Get to you get to Andy in a second here, you know. So I just want to add this to the end of the story. You get the good gist of it. I don't but, have anything that exciting, but <laughs> yeah, that's not true. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Well, not as scary anyway. Well, let, let, let's wrap it up. Let, yeah. So the story. Part um. Yeah. So that's 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 kind of the climax of the book. That's not the the, the full story of the book. Yeah. No. I mean, I yeah. I want people to get the book. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm There's just I'm thankful. I'm thankful for you coming on here and sharing. Yeah. No problem. Even and remotely close to as much as you did. You yeah. know what I mean? That, that's, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. my yeah. really pleasure. appreciate pleasure. that. You know what I mean? It was, thank you for having me. You know, you went through a lot and you know yeah. what I mean? And obviously it stuck with you all these years and everything like that. And I'm glad you're putting a positive turn on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And we're fortunate yeah. and thankful that you came on to share that with us. Thank you. I mean, I can, truly. I can tell you as someone that was uh, friends with both of them and, and as Tiny talked about earlier, that, that, that knows the story in great detail, read the book. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot more to it. I can tell you, yeah. it's one of the most incredible. Well, that's I mean, I've, fiction that you couldn't write this book. non you know, real life stories like this yeah. are better than fiction. You could never write this, and the details and all the things that happen. I can tell you personally from my knowledge of it all that it will blow people's mind. And also Tiny's perspective of overcoming it all and how he can sit there and say, "Look, I'm not, I'm not emotionally, you know, affected by it." And I wanted to help people and be it be a story about you know persevering and how choices are made yeah. and all of that. All about I think is is amazing. And I I who know the story really well and have you know been you know been around it since the early days. Yeah. I can't wait to read the book. Yeah. And I know the story as well as anybody. You would yeah. say right. Yeah. And and I can't wait to read it from Tiny's perspective and and what he overcame and and how he can look at the how he can look at this and say hey man this is I don't look at this as woe is me. This is this is something yeah. positive yeah, that happened in my 100%. life, which is mind blowing that he's 
been able to to make that transformation of something that was yeah. so um you know strange unique unique, unique. And, and take it to the perspective he has and i i really honestly for brother, sure man, this, this is where really andy comes in i just want to finish with this no, go ahead. on my end yeah so so after that experience i was obviously i didn't have the same uh understanding or perspective on it that i have today but what i did know back then was that was not, i did not want that to be my 15 minutes that i was known for right that was not going to be my 15 minutes of fame and what i did was i was friends with this guy and i, I it's unique how we met we actually i walked up to him in the complete angler kind of aggressively with a couple of drinks in me one night and said i said hey man like don't you ever talk to anybody? Like, he was just standing in a corner like a bouncer, like Lurch, you know? And I actually, everybody was scared of him, you know? So I actually had, That's the, Andy. I, I had yeah. the balls to walk up to him, and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm like, what's your deal, man? What's your story? And I was like, I was probably pissing him off that night, but we actually became friends that night. But after the hijacking, I decided that I did not want to be known for that experience. That is not mm -hmm. what was going to define me. I wanted to be known as a fisherman. I wanted to be known as, I wanted to be respected in the fishing world. And I got, that experience is what got me really serious about fishing. And then I was smart enough to realize if you want to be the best, you have to study the best. Mm -hmm. And that's where I became really good friends with him. And I started studying everything he did, whether it was sitting for him, with him for hours in LMR Tackle Shop. We had a mutual friend and mentor which was Bart Miller at the time. Both mm -hmm. of us were very close with him. And Andy and I would would share his philosophies and share his his theories. I have always followed Andy, as, and the ideas he had were so cutting edge. Like, I, I, I think between um, really being close to him at that time and studying him and wanting to win like he did and compete like he did and have the class that he did in, in the tournament uh, circuit and the respect, like, I had to study him, you know? So he and I became really good friends. And uh, he was so far ahead of his time with his his ideas of fishing, which were all original. I just pretty much copied him for the majority of my my uh, my career, which served me really well. I mean, I won tournaments with him, and sometimes I gave him hell on, on the rip, you know? But he was he's definitely an innovator. And I would say that even if he wasn't sitting here, mm -hmm. you know, I think he's the best fisherman in the world, hands yeah, down. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. And, but I can tell you, as a guy that's fished with both of you guys and worked, uh, whether mating for you or working in the cockpit for you, Tiny, you, you've got some amazing, like, I learned uh, sharpening hooks with you and your scalpel uh, methods you had. And I remember... It all changes. Yeah, yeah, it all changed. But I remember my hands would bleed. Uh, I'd have bloody hands after spending uh, the night with Tiny sharpening hooks the way Tiny... It's like, right a right of passage, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and and same with same with Andy. And like I don't have the same perspective on Andy that Tiny has because I've known Andy since he was I was a kid. Right. And so he was such a kind guy to me as a kid. As a kid, I was a little kid, and so like he was never scary to me mm -hmm. um, as he was to everybody. You know, as you know, he was this I don't kind. Know. Andy's and kind of still scary to me. No, but. and he's like that with my children. <laughs> he's like that with my kids now. Like he's just this. You know, I mean, right, Andy? I mean, you remember teaching me as a kid yeah. all the things, and he was just the most helpful, kind guy at, at to a nine, ten year old kid that you could be. Um, so well, it's I, interesting to hear Tiny's yeah. perspective. You know, like super inspiration. I think. Th listen, I think the thing is about everyone at this table, right? And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you guys, right? All three are the genuine article. Right? Thank you. That's then. That's the truth, and, it, and and I think that's what make, makes you special. You know, it, is that, you know, it, it's no BS. It's what you see is what you get. You know, you're not trying to be anything that you're not. No, just it just happens to, be a, happens to be an extreme coincidence that you guys are the best at what you do. You know what I mean? They and are, then that yeah. makes it even better. You know what I mean? Well, so it's, the, it's, it's the humbleness of the you. nature, you know, right. and, and then just, just the excellence of your craft. People you know always I mean? ask, they say, well, what is what is it that makes this guy better than that guy? It's It's a bunch of little things that makes up. The yeah. one big thing. Yeah. And if you don't pay attention to all the little details, you're going to miss out on the big picture because when your opportunity comes, if, yeah. if one thing's not right, you're going to miss it, you know? And it's, uh, it, it goes back to that, I failed. Yeah. I had my opportunity, but I didn't take it. I blew it. But 
it's a little different when it's your life versus catching a <laughs> yeah, fish. But also, too, like, did you learn from that moment? We, and and how, how are you going to accept that moment? And what are you going to do with it? And the yeah. thing is, you know like, what I mean? when we were fishing, it was it was a turning point in in sport fishing. So you're going from strictly bait fishing into this lure fishing thing, which we were all trying to figure out. And we knew that we had to fish lures to because we're trying to catch big fish and we're trying to cover ground in the Bahamas. There's still guys that were strictly bait fishermen. Um, but for the most part, we smoked those guys because we were covering area and blue marlin love lures. I, I mean, yeah. I don't care what you say. The blue big marlin ones. loves lures. Yeah, big ones. And sure. we were fishing for one fish. Yeah. We weren't trying yeah. to catch little Your ones. BBCs were much different than they are today. Right. Yeah. And right. listen, you adapt and you, the thing I always say is don't be good at one thing, be good at all things. You know, from snook fishing to bass fishing to marlin fishing. If you can be good at all those things, you're going to be a great fisherman. This next segment I got coming up here real quick is going to speak to that about you in a minute, right? And I tried to segue this before by saying strange, but you guys didn't bite on it, right? So you guys are smarter fish than me, right? So, but I am going to read off our strange questions here. Right. Yeah. So that's, can I that's pee it. Real quick? Yeah, you can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll wait till you get back to, to read this off then, right? So we're going to do our Papa's Peel Our Strange Questions, right? Because yep. um, because I got no way to follow that. That's fine. <laughs> All right. That, you, that, that's, it's, that's, it's, the it's that's the truth of the matter. It's story, man. That's the truth of the matter. It's like, I got, no, I, I got nothing I can say really that's going to follow that and be meaningful, right? So we're going to ask our questions and we're going to segue the rest of this thing over, right, to switch that conversation. But yeah. we can chime in on on some of the things that we talked about that you went through and i got a shit ton of questions for you yeah no problem i just want to say i just want to say again you know like if you find a good a good model man if you find somebody who can you can look up to and somebody that can teach you you can get through any hard time in life yeah no that's hard that's true like if it wasn't for the diversion of trying to compete with this guy, Mm -hmm. like i I, god knows where i would have ended up you know but i wanted i wanted to beat him i wanted to I wanted to, you like know, I wanted to yeah. know. I mean, we drove each other. Well, this, yeah. is why I, this is why I wanted them in the room today. Yeah. No, you know absolutely. I mean? Couldn't have been for, for the reason, just the reason that you're saying, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, he's a super influential guy in my yeah. life. Like, like the success that I've had tournament fishing, I definitely, like, it was, it. we definitely drove each other. We definitely had a friendly, mm-hmm. com- a friendly competition going on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We you made know? a lot of other people mad. Yeah. Because for a while there, it was either him or us. I mean, yeah, it was like right. they would win one, we would win one, or we would win two. They would win. It just, it was always people are just like, what is going on here? Yeah. yeah. What Fast. is going on here? Fast, too. Well, that's we, it, man. I mean, that that's what it takes sometimes. Yeah. To, I mean, we're to, young, too, you know, in our 20s. and um, But we were different people. Like, we were killers, you know? Yeah. It was a and mentality. If, and then with the guy that I fished with, Jack Plachter, for years, he he ran the boat, and I ran the cockpit, and he never had to ask a question because he knew everything was right, and he always said it. He said, hope the right one gets on there and stays on because it's going to die. Yeah. And that was it. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Between me and Josh and, and Kim Manning, whoever I was working with. Or me. Coach or, as a, it was going to happen. Yeah. It, it was – there was no doubt in my mind it was going to happen, and – yeah, we had some really crazy things happen to us, like fish running into cruise ships. And, oh, yeah, yeah. remember and that? Just remember that? The, yeah, broke the bill. You know, fish halfway in the boat like and all, 97 the, all the bull sharks come in and just crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy stuff. But, yeah, I mean, it was uh, – but those days are gone. Yeah. You'll never get that back. You'll never see what we got to see. Right. You know, now it's all 80-pound leader and – you know, dink baits 40. and 40. yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a difference between catching a fish and killing a fish. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And it's all going to go wrong at the side of the boat. That's where it's all going to, yeah. The right. end game is going to be the hardest part. Mm-hmm. And some guys just don't have that. They yeah. don't have it. Kids today, these young guys, most of them, unless they go to Australia or somewhere like that, they will never get to experience that. Yeah. So, you know, this is one of the, th- one of the things that we kind of touched on it on the previous podcast too. Um, but just a couple of days ago with like little Timmy and, and, and mm-hmm. little Hunter, they, they kept catching that, um, awesome that huge, that huge yeah. shorty. 767. Incredible. But the marvel of that whole moment to me was them getting it in the boat. 
Yeah. 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 You know, that's a big ass fish for those kids to pull yeah. in that boat. Absolutely. Right. And so them actually getting in that boat, that to me was was the true achievement. Oh, yeah. Boys oh, had that special fish. tools made to get big fish in the boat. Remember you I still remember, have one. Right? Yeah. You remember he had special he tools it. that yeah. he invented to get in the boat. Because I, I, like, dude, if you gotta yeah. get a fish in the boat and there's yeah. sharks on gotta you. Be quick. Yeah. And mean, you got and you're talking about a half million dollar fish or a quarter million yeah. dollar fish coming in the boat. The one like, one fish when the sharks came put that in my head and I'm like, I have to make something that we can right. do this. We're talking about a meat hook with prongs on it. Yeah, prongs. it was yeah. cool, man. So the rope just went around the bill and one time and around it. the prongs, and you could pull them in the boat. Yeah. And it got copied by a gaff company in Hawaii, <laughs> in uh, Australia. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, <laughs> you're used to your 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 uh, things being. Yeah, I mean, it was it was almost a a compliment that somebody copied right. sure. that. But well, you know, you know, coming back to what he's talking about, like, mm-hmm. we we'll just want to add to this. The thing. You know, we all we have watched the the tournaments change, right? And I right. not to sound like an old guy. I don't I don't want to be like, oh well back in my day or whatever, you know, like Andy and I No, yeah, you, you come know, on here to share your experience. Yeah, yeah, but the the thing the thing that I think I miss the most about the transition in the tournaments, I get that we've gone to a release format. I get that it's points. I get that it's you know, it's great. People are keeping track of their sailfish on, on paper plates now or whatever. But <laughs> but here here's the thing. The thing that I miss the most is the mentality that that right. all of us had to right. have to kill that fish. Yeah. It was not a mentality of reach out and grab 40 pound leader and pop it pop off. It, it was right. it was almost like you were when you were fishing for that fish, you were almost thinking about it like a bar fight and you played that fight over in your head a million times mm-hmm. as you're sitting there watching those lures it, every day and that doesn't really exist anymore. And that's why you see a lot of things happen at the boat these days because I think people have gotten away from that thinking because they don't have to anymore. That's well, not like a hunter's tournament. mentality it, more exactly. Than, yeah. it, it dude, if it, if exactly. a tail got nipped by a shark after you caught it, it was disqualified. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you're you're sitting there with a big fish trying to get if it just got nipped by a shark at the back of the boat, you were out. Yeah. Yeah. All that all the other stuff didn't matter. And listen, mm-hmm. it happened to a yeah. lot of guys. Yeah. A lot of guys. A lot of guys. Yep. They fought fish too long. Mm-hmm. They didn't know about drag. They didn't know about applying drag at the right time and not applying well, how drag. How to get it in the boat? Just the just the process of not messing around once you gaffed your fish come on we, we need to go Gotta move every no celebration everybody grab a piece of the rope and pull because you want it in the boat right now and that door better be closed because i've actually seen mako sharks come in the door and try to get the fish they will they'll stick their head right in the boat and, and that's all it would take yep. and i can One say bite. i can say from fishing with both these guys and I, obviously i've been out of the game for a long time okay this was in my younger years um i was lucky enough to do it but like working with both these guys, it was like we didn't have to speak. We knew what it was. It was a. It was you knew what you were gonna do. Mm-hmm. You saw something. You read the other guy. You knew what exactly. Hey, this conditions this way, and you were like literally on the same page without even saying a word mm-hmm. with these guys when you worked with them, and yeah. you you spent time really doing a system with these guys fishing, whether at Costa Rica or the Bahamas or St. Thomas, there was no words. You didn't need to speak words. It yeah. was, it was understood where your position was, right? It was, yeah, it no, was, we worked like machines. Yeah. I fished mm-hmm. with him last year. It was incredible. Right. The crash course I got from him in three days. Right. The first day on my own, I think I caught from his tutelage, yeah. three, three bluefins over a grant the first day, just getting a crash course from him in two and a half days and doing what he did. Yeah. Like, it was just that amazing, you know, like, mm-hmm. like he can teach you things that, you know, he's caught. What are you up to now? 1,500 blue thousands. Uh, over a thousand. Well, no, he's, yeah, over a thousand. 1,300, something yeah. like that. I mean, how many, there's not many people alive that can say that, you know? No. So and I, I keep, I keep talking about on the show all the time about this glorious trip to Nova Scotia with Andy that, that is that John's over there laughing because he knows I do, which is not happening yet. <laughs> it was just going to be this year and they're like, oh, okay, COVID. Shut down. Yeah. yeah. But it's something that everyone yeah. needs to see before they see die. Yeah. yeah. So next, Absolutely. next year we're. You got questions. And John, I can, John's had great trips there. I've, yeah, I've had great trips. I've caught, I don't know, what, 13 with yeah. you or something? Yeah. Um, and uh, I can tell fishing with, like, uh, fishing with both these guys. Tiny's got a lot of, you know, he, he they have, they're, they're great fishermen, but everybody has their unique style. And Tiny taught me a lot. Um, and Andy taught me a lot. And I can just say that both of them approach it like I've never seen anyone else I've ever, ever fished with in the cockpit yeah. or, or, or on a boat. They they just approach things and they're very precise and they're very um, they I I don't know how to say the right words to explain how how 
great of fishermen Good thing, and what a lucky experience I had growing up at a young age, being able to fish with you guys. And now I get to go and, and, and fish with Andy and charter him or, or you know, Go Coast. fishing with me, man. Yeah, okay. yeah, you know, I still get to enjoy it, right? And and Andy still spends time with my, with my little son, and and uh, it's a uh, it's a special relationship that we all have uh, from from the old days uh, to this day, For sure. and friendship uh, that we all have. That's uh, something I cherish uh, in my life. So hearing that, right, and then hearing about what you went through, I mean, and it, it's so great that you can take that moment and put. it into the positive yeah. of your life rather yeah. than the other way yeah you know, yep. which unfortunately yeah. you know what i mean yeah. but it's a choice yeah but but uh, the choice gets made when you have friends and camaraderie that's, a, that, like that's what i'm that's what i'm saying yeah. so yeah w- w- to have that support mechanism yeah. but also when you choose that route i mean this is your reward yeah absolutely you Good know friends. what i mean this Life-long is life friends. you know what i mean yeah, yeah. yeah. we uh, haven't absolutely. seen each other in a while man it, 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 could be 20 years. No matter, like, right? Yeah, we, that's the beauty of fishermen. That's a camaraderie. I can say this for a fact that I've gotten out of this. You guys are connected by water. Connected by water, We're right? There's a spe- No matter where you go around the world, and I, I know people have said this on the show before on the podcast, there's a special camaraderie amongst fishermen. Mm-hmm. There's rivalry. There's Sure, there is, but there's a special camaraderie. There's a special unwritten code amongst fishermen. No matter whether they're fishing for a lobster or a giant tuna or a marlin or a black marlin, there's a special thing i've gotten out of the business at times i've started my own business and, and actually searched for that camaraderie in other areas and it doesn't it doesn't exist. exist and one of the best things about coming back to fishing is like walking back into it like it like you like it was never missed a day you know and mm-hmm. fishermen are really special people like you said they're connected by water they're connected to the universe they're connected to the ocean they're connected to all of nature just like hunters yeah and the thing is too because we, we've analyzed i mean you've heard the show we've analyzed this on the show and one conclusion we've came up with on that is that you know yeah you can go fishing with a guy and you're going to remember that day for years to come when you see that guy you may have only met him once but you met him on that boat mm-hmm. and you're going to see him years later and be like yeah we we fished together yeah you're, you know anchored, I mean? and you're anchored yeah, to that moment right yeah. and then there's different and we, we always question why is that why is that why is that one of the conclusions that we came up with is it's innate in our nature to be primal right atavistic absolutely yeah. these guys are primal and, and, <laughs> and so you could probably speak to this i'm not a hunter you know what i mean although andy says he's going to take me hunting one of these days but right so but you, you've explained to me that hunting is the same way it is it has to be the same fishing way is hunting right that's what i mean so it's, it has to be the same way it's like this primal nature yeah. when you, like man and man get together and go for that kill mm-hmm. right or the, or they they go for that hunt right and that's it's, it's in our nature as humans Absolutely. it's in our nature as men to be that way mm-hmm. i mean yeah. that's why i think and it women matters. too women too women yeah too. yeah, yeah. no women women. women too women too i think i still think that they don't approach it with the identical mentality that we do you know what i mean i, th- I think there are some some different you know Women are more Elements effective at it. Women are more effective. They listen better, right? They're more effective at it, period. Women make the best anglers in the world. Women do make the best anglers in the world, but, the, but that's not the point I'm ta- yeah, I, talking I get you. about. I get you know you. what I mean? It's the, it's the they mindset. Certainly the they certainly the do. They certainly do. They got the touch. Yes. You know yeah, what I mean? The finesse, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and um, But I, I definitely think that there, there is that primal aspect of it, and I really do think that that's what the glue is. Like you said, when I posted that video the other day from the lightning strike uh bluefin we caught at five in the morning yeah, yeah. or whatever and you're like you realize you got to i'm telling you that's yeah, gonna yeah. make a painting you got frankenstein that, you got that's frankenstein. Gonna, that would be a good painting sitting next you get the guy in there grunting with the big rod and a lightning bolt going off yeah. with the awesome. rain the and the crazy thing ocean. is yeah. that lightning bolt hit the boat behind us yeah and, it and, did? Knocked, and out. knocked out their brand new boat yeah. all their oh, engines electronic oh, the yeah. boat was two weeks old yeah really knocked out everything on the boat Wow. Mm-hmm. The experiences you have on the sea are amazing. Um, I and here he is sitting in a metal fighting chair with fishing <laughs> rod. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. I mean, it was the gnarliest morning. Just yeah, Believe my, it or not, that was like 7 o'clock in the morning. It should have been broad daylight. Kayla, yeah, was, Kayla was not and, happy about me, happy with me still to this day about that moment. But I was my turn up, and dude... We were marking fish. I threw the bait yeah. in the water, and we were on. It was like, this is just what we're supposed to do. do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then he's in the chair, and I'm like, oh, God, I wouldn't want to be in there. Hey, hey. Hair standing up. And I can tell you, like, I've been lost at sea coming back from St. Thomas, and these guys found us. Remember when the boat, the, the mm-hmm. chase boat got lost? And we yeah, were, yeah. Dave, Zach, and I were lost at sea, and yeah. you guys found us. I mean, And then the drug runners almost ran the, the little boat the, over, yeah, and the they, drug, hit the they hit the buoy. I remember that. All remember, the cocaine floated up. Yeah. Oh, no. I have video of that. 
Actually, hit the video, booty like three in the morning or something. No, like. yeah, it was like yeah. nine at night. Yeah, because yeah. we got dragged. We were, yeah, you guys all and and when we got lost <laughs> at sea, Dave, Zach, and I were coming back in the chase mm. boat because we were filming Blue Marlin underwater, crazy, uh, in St. Thomas, and Dave, Zach had to take the boat back, so I went back with him, and then we get lost, and all the boats that were coming back from the drop. Yeah, you guys ran out of fuel. No, I don't. And you were drifting. Well, something was broken. You were drifting. Yeah, we were. Dr- well, we, yeah. no, we found a long line gear and tied. Oh, to and it. you were that, tied up to it. That's, that's the right. only thing that saved us from yeah. from moving. Um, and <laughs> it, but all the boats coming back in from the North Drop, and we were in like a twenty three foot like little like uh, center console, and all the boats come c- came back in, and started doing search patterns, grid patterns to find us. Yeah. I remember one time I was fishing off Marathon eons ago i must have been like 17 years old me and my brother or whatever we hooked in a, a double on two massive bull mahis I, we were way like 25 miles off marathon you know in the gulf stream we fought these things forever we got them both on the boat we're like yeah we're like boom big day big day we're like oh we're tired. let's just go in let's just go we got these two huge mahis right we're coming in like we're like we don't see bonefish tower we don't see bonefish tower right we're coming in we're seeing land we're like we don't see bonefish tower and sure enough, we like pull up. We see like it says Bud and Marys like right there. I'm like, oh my god, the Gulf Stream like pushed us all the way up the Island Rod while we were fighting those Mahi. We didn't even know it. It'll do that. <laughs> that and then, like, we had like this is like what in the 80s, you know, yeah. like no GPS, yeah. no, nothing like that on this little Mako. You know what I mean? So it was like, yeah, we just had a compass. That's what got yeah, us in going south. Yeah, That's so funny. So. All right, I'm going to read these strange questions real quick because I have to read them. Right. right? So all this right. is the Papa's PLR strange questions. And there's only a couple of them because I knew that we were going to focus on this story. All right, so I didn't fish too hard for the questions, but we do have a couple from, uh, let's see. Actually, one I have to ask real quick, right? And this is a strange question that was submitted technically, right, by your sister. Um, and that's who was on the phone with Jenny when you walked in, right? So she wants to know if you've ever jumped off a dock to catch a fish because you couldn't catch a fish without a rod. I did when I was probably eight years old in the Bahamas. I was trying to catch these um, these pompanets, palomettas, mm-hmm. and this thing would not eat my bait. And he was <laughs> swimming around, swimming around. The water was about that deep. And finally, I just had enough, and I just jumped off the seawall on top of him in <laughs> the shallow full, water. And did I, a full Ric Flair on and it. And I caught it. And I caught it. <laughs> nice. Nice shocker. Yeah. <laughs> hey, my mom's like, did you fall in? I'm like, no, I jumped on this fish. I got him. In my teeth. Hey, that's yeah. almost like the story you told about when I caught the sailfish free jumping. Yeah, caught him twice. I caught, we pulled the hook. Tell, tell the story. It's kind of. So a- the fish was jumping and we were live baiting for black marlin at the time. And I said, just throw the bait out there. He'll eat it. And we hooked it and he's got it on the leader and it, it jumps next to the boat. And I, we had it on video. He jumps back, and the bill goes inside of his shirt like this and pulls out. And the fish hits the water. I'm like, just cut that thing off. So he cuts it off, and I pull away, and I see the fish. He starts jumping again. He's coming at the boat. And I'm like, he's going to come right next to the boat, free jumping. And he's coming. I'm like, here he comes, Johnny. Turns around. I go, just grab him when he comes by. And he he was in the air like this. And Johnny reaches out and grabs him by the bill. A black Marlin? No, no sail. sail. Oh. But, but, but free free jumping, not hooks. I was like, <laughs> fly a flag for a double flag. We yeah. just we just caught the same fish we twice. Caught, oh caught man, that's awesome. Hook, awesome. Jumping at the boat, just grab him by the bill and got the shit beaten out of me. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh awesome. my god, that's great. Just that's a hilarious. fun story. I mean, the ocean connected by water, all that stuff. Yeah. You, there's stories that are. All right, so our first que- or second question, because that was from Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, yes. for, for the question, right? <laughs> uh, Dr. Charlie Gregory wrote in, um, and that is your chief partner. Chief science officer. You, you chief science officer PhD, of the, yeah. for, the, for the Clean Waterways company that you have. Um, please ask the old Seamaster Fish Sages. This isn't Charlie Gregory's way yeah, of delivering. Yeah, to these guys, yeah. Right? Um, about the smartest fish that they've ever known. Bluefin tuna. Bluefin? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. I would say blue marlin. I would say bluefin tuna are definitely the smartest when it comes to hooking or biting them. Mm-hmm. But I, I, my experience with really big blue marlin is they can actually have the ability to problem solve and learn during a fight. Mm-hmm. And I experienced that a few times, and it didn't end well. I actually, I'm sure you have too. I'm sure you have. But 
you know, the old saying, if something ain't working, try something different, right? And right. I've watched, you know, they've proven that trout can can go through a maze to find a, a, a scrap of food. And I think the same thing goes to Blue Marlin. If you're fighting a Blue Marlin a certain way, especially a big one, I'm talking a really, really big one, the thing is learning through the fight. And if you know that while you get, in, you know, connected to one, mm-hmm. you can do a lot of different stuff. A lot of people try to play it safe, and the fish will learn a pattern. And I've learned that, and it usually ends in the fish's favor. Yeah. They are smart. They, they may not be in the literal sense of thinking, but they definitely have the ability to learn They're instinctive. During a fight. They're instinctive. They didn't get big and they, being and they, stupid. they learn in a fight. Yeah. And the biggest ones I've ever dealt with have all learned during the fight. When, I, when we were getting That's close. Cool. That's when really we were cool. getting close to them, when we were getting close to close the, closing the deals, the fish realized what was going on and did something yeah. totally different, which usually ended in, a, in oh. it getting away. And that's where the whole difference between not playing it safe and being aggressive, yep. like with your drag and boat handling and things like that, that's where all that came in. You know, the guys that, that dealt with big fish a lot, like James Roberts mm-hmm. fishing in Madeira, you get a blue marlin in Madeira, thousand pound fish he's gonna he or she is gonna give it everything she's got to get away from you and if you don't react in a split second and turn the boat and run that fish down i don't care what size tackle you're using you're gonna be out of line Mm -hmm. and you're gonna be done because she's gonna go straight down dead or you're just gonna run out of line and that's where the whole running the fish down comes in and you know using drag the right lightening your drag off when she's doing that and then once you get near the end game going heavy on the drag and really being able to pull on fish mm-hmm. or like you say switching sides on her yep. learning, learning how to pull learning how to pull learning how to stay ahead of the learning curve of the yeah. fish is important yeah and, and you know bart miller taught both of us bart miller barky garnsey you know charles perry earl keen they all taught us the first 20 minutes on a connected to a really big fish yep. the first 20 minutes dictates who's going to win and who's yeah, going to lose. Yeah, they give you a chance. That you got you have 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah. The first 15 to 20 minutes dictates who's going to win that fight. It could be True. a 4-hour fight, but the first 20 what you do in that first 20 minutes is jockeying for position. Uh, and jockeying yeah. for, again, talking right. about the bar fight mentality. Usually yeah. when you throw the first punch in a bar fight, you win or in any yeah. fight you win. You have an advantage, right? Yeah. If you let the fish dictate even for a few minutes, the fir- in the beginning of the fight, you're done. You're done. Mm-hmm. You're done. Yep. If you play it safe, you're done. Yep. Yeah. And people want to do that when there's a lot of money on the line. People want to do that when it's, you know, recently we fished for $4.9 million in Cabo a couple months ago. I was on a boat that... I was rooting for both of you. Yeah, you know, and, and it's just like, and yeah, Andy was there too. And, and, you know, like, you have to have, that's, again, it comes to the mentality. You're trying owner. to run the clock out when you got a lead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You you know, you've seen, you've heard the, the nightmares of fish getting lost, but that first 20 minutes of the fight... I owe, it has served me well in my career to Absolutely. have that understanding, like be very aggressive yeah. the yeah. first 20 minutes. Do not, do not wait for fish to settle down. There's a time to go easy on a fish. It yeah. doesn't mean you have to put a lot of drag on them. Usually we keep the drags light the first 20 minutes of the mm-hmm. fight, just like the circle hook theory or mentality. Because it won't but, change anything. Right. Exactly. You can, you can, it's like a bluefin tuna. You can hook him and go to 60, mm-hmm. 70 pounds. You're going to lose just as much line as right. you would yeah. with 20 pounds. The only difference is... You're chafing your line up, and you're you're hurting your tackle. You save that tackle to when you catch up with the fish. It's like he went to the gym, okay? Goes to the gym, works out, or he just ran three, four miles. And then, you know, you run your five miles or whatever, and then some guy comes around the corner and wants to fight you. You're going to be out of gas. So right. what we do is that fish is oxygen depleted. You run him down. And then you've you've closed the gap on the fish, and so now you have less stretch in your line. You have you have a better chance to pull harder. And then that's when you put it to him. And he, he's he spent. He's oxygen depleted. He's got lactic acid in his in his muscles, and he's just like, okay, mm-hmm. you got me. And, and, right. you know? and most fish, like you guys have both taught me, boat handling is important because most fish will give you a chance to catch them in the first 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Absolutely. They'll give you that chance. They'll come up to the surface. If you're if you're on your game, they'll make that mistake in the first twenty minutes. It's like world before record they, fishing, like you said too, yep. you don't want them to learn more. No, once mm-hmm. they once once they give you that chance, you got to get it because yep. you don't get that chance very often. If you're world record fishing and that fish comes to the top, you better you take get that it. opportunity yeah. because to, to, exactly, to or quote, else it's done. You're it's done. done. You get you get one shot. To quote Jerry Dunaway, that I learned from him in 1993, who owned the Madam of the Hooker and. Yep. You know, hold, holds more world records than most people. Met him and been on the boat with him, yeah. 
Yeah, and he he actually said to me the first day I ever spent with him, he said, "If it jumps, it's ready to die. die. Yeah. If it jumps, it dies. If it's yeah. jumping and it's on top, it can be killed. Killed. Yeah. It's about the mentality you go about and how you get that done. That's yeah. your job. Nice. Yeah. It's a, it's the captain's job to make them jump. Yeah. And, a, and the angler's job to stay connected. Yeah. It's a world record. We're talking world record fishing. The angler's right. only trying. Right. He's not trying to wear a fish down. He's trying to stay connected. Yeah. yeah. And get get within range. You know. And that's yeah. that's where that's. Where, Doing that is where the rubber hits the road. Whether you're a wireman, a gaff man, a boat driver, it all has to come together perfectly. Yep. You know, and, and between all those people, all those people to and make it happen. Everybody, everybody first. has to work. Everybody's yep. job is equally as important when it comes to that game. That's why there's not many people that do it anymore. You know? yep. Right. But it's, wow. You're only as strong as your weakest link. That's it. Uh, yep. And there can be none in, yep. that, in that game. Yep. Nope. None. That's solid like stuff, giant tuna dude. fishing. If you have a weak link, you're gonna find out really fast. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, it's gonna be over. You know, learn. You know, uh, just one more thing. Yeah, good. To, to w- what I saw and witnessed this last year uh, with Andy with the tuna fish. You know, like he's talking about. It's it's about going about it really smart. We would actually, when I fished with him, we would actually lead a tuna that that it, it, we didn't have any drag on the fish. We'd actually lead the fish away from our nets. Like walk a giant tuna, a giant bluefin that's eight or nine or a thousand pounds around nets, still chumming, yeah. st- on the line, literally does not know it's hooked. Yeah. But because of how the boat's being maneuvered and how it's being driven and the chumming going on, they think the boat's just moving away, so they're moving with it. And there's a hook in the fish's mouth. Yeah. The hook's on. The fish is on. But once you get clear, that's when you push the drag up. And then, of course, they turn west like always, yeah, right. and phew, you're off to the. But it is the coolest thing to walk these fish around everybody's nets and other boats. And, and just by going about fishing in a really smart, scientific way, which is yeah. what they figured out up there for years. You know? mm-hmm. yeah. Super cool. I mean, you're, you're controlling a wild fish yeah. in the water that's on your line. And you're getting to do what you need to do. Right. Pretty, pretty right. cool. It doesn't always go that way. But, yeah. Yeah. but a lot of times Best it does. Best case scenario. Controlling yeah. the panic. Yeah. Control the panic. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. No panic, right? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. solid stuff, guys. Um, the next question, thank you, Dr. Charlie Gregory for, uh, the Seamaster. He's a great uh, guy. Smartest fish. He is a great guy. Um, and, uh, let me see what else he asks here. Um, says, uh, well, actually we're going to go to Mike Lambrick. So I'm going to go, cause I, we don't have a lot of time for all these, for a lot of these questions. He has like three questions. Lambrick does. Um, but one of the ones I want to ask from him, um, says, what is the most obvious difference fishing out front when you look at what it is today versus 20 years ago? And I think that speaks to Mike Lambrick's from the CCA, Coastal Conservation Association. So I think specifically he wants to understand from your guys' experience, what are the big differences that you see right right here at your home base? Than, than different. Lack of bait. Mm-hmm. Sharks. Right. Sharks and lack of bait. Sharks. Yep. Yeah. Sharks. Sharks. Percent. Sharks. And we all know where sharks came from. When, when you create more food, you create more predators. It's just like deer and coyotes and everything else. So... Over management of red snapper, over management of Goliath groupers. You're creating more food for a predator, and you're also d- decreasing the amount of natural bait, which is going to make those animals eat whatever they can eat. And that's why the, these guys are getting sailfish attacked and everything else attacked by them. Yeah, you know? and also they lifted. Um, they recently lifted regulations. Correct. Like two years ago, right? Was right. it? There's a lot of over management. We're kind of seeing like the effect of saying, okay, now you get end the long line restrictions. And Dr. Charles right? Gregory has talked about He's that. He's on the yeah. side of that. Where he yeah. says, hey, there's over management of certain high predators that actually is leading to an imbalance in the ecosystem yeah. because they're overprotected and it's actually making it worse for. And I mean, who knows that maybe the decline in our reef system is causing the decrease in bait. Um, right. You used to be able to go to the balls and catch all the pilchards you wanted any night, yeah. and now it's almost impossible to catch pilchards. Yeah. And big we're, ones. We're talking big about ones, yeah. a, a bait fish that supports so many game fish from the reef to blue water, and yeah. then everything else goes with it. Goggle eyes, threadfin herring. You used to catch yeah. them in the Port Everglades yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. That's where you went and caught threadfins was on the tide line in Port Everglades. Yeah. I don't even think you can do that anymore. No. You know, and that's uh, – the water water quality. It's we come, water come quality. back to water quality. Yeah, yeah. you know. We had uh, Thomas Osborne on the show uh, with Patrick Price, Daymaker Charters up there, um, Jensen Beach area, and Thomas Osborne is like one of the few guys that has um, the license to do the long lining for the sharks, and you know, and a lot of it is research based too. And he's the one that he got his that's all cut up. You guys yep, know yep, the story. The so story. after we heard that story, we brought him on the show. Yeah. 
but he enlightened us on a lot of that uh, with the regulations and you know, and he's kind of like the guy that they really need to listen to and they just don't want to. Right. And then Art's on the board and he's trying to like talk our piece like to the, the you know to the net, the Marine Fisheries Council and they don't want to listen to him. Yeah, they're trying, to, they're, trying to, they're trying to do it on science based on inexperience. Mm -hmm. Well, when I when I have yeah. guys like this support <clears throat> what we're trying to do with the cleaning the waterways, mm -hmm. I know I'm in the right direction. Right. Because these guys are, are guys that are that are seeing it every day. Mm -hmm. And like Art Sapp or, yep. or Andy or, or Jason, like those are the guys, you know, if they're if they're supportive of, of what we're what. Is trying to happen with cleaning the waterways. We know we're, we're going in the right direction. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't we don't want to kill all sharks. No, we we know sharks are a huge. You can part. now. You can. I mean, you can you can know you can't kill all of them, but you can. Hey, listen, you can take one. But people aren't even doing that because it's not easy. Right, well, you like, gotta, it's going to mess up yeah. your deck. I mean, it's not like it's not that simple. It's what like happens? A, you is could it, easily say, "Oh, you they allow you one. You can kill them now and everything like that." But who wants to do that? Nobody wants to. It's do a that. pain it's in the, the ass. It is. It is. It's kind of you know. Yeah. It's a waste of life too. There's got to be a better right. way to ma manage. Right, kill that. just to kill, but you know what I mean. What yeah. they need to look at is that why is one species of shark? How, why has that become so prevalent? The bull shark. Why are there so many bull sharks now than what there was ten years ago, fifteen years ago? Bimini. Even when we had kill tournaments there, and there was marlin carcasses in the water, it was mostly lemon sharks, reef yeah. sharks, a hammerhead, tiger yeah. every now and then. Not yeah. thirty bull sharks. Yeah. yeah. They just weren't around. Yeah. Not in numbers like that. And even ti would, even yeah. tigers too. The dive yeah. excursion the dive excursions sometimes are are sometimes yeah. people like to blame it. I don't they're know if I believe them, it hundred percent. They're feeding them at the dock in Bimini with a cage. Sharks yeah. are smart. They're not dumb. They learn, right? Yeah. They they're see the boat pull up, they come. They think it's a food source. They've been on this planet for millions of years, <laughs> right. you know. They know how to adapt. They know how to learn. I yeah. mean, all of us here at this table know that in St. Thomas, when you hook the yellowfin tuna and you pull that boat out of here, and we're talking <laughs> yeah. 20 years ago, um, that the you, ratios are getting so I, bad now. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, back then, I think, I think in the 17 seasons in St. Thomas, I think I probably got half a dozen yellowfins to the boat ever, right, right. ever. But you know, the thing that's scary here, like you talk about Art Sap, he has an amazing video. Have you seen that video of the hammerhead eating mm -hmm. the tarpon? But mm -hmm. the, the scary thing here, I, and I had a close encounters, uh, close call with a. 600 pound tiger shark in Boat, Homer, Boat Harbor Marina last year, uh, checking a prop at night, which is terrifying. Hands down, one of the most terrifying experiences. I think of my I was life. there. With it was absolutely, yeah, you might yeah. have been. It was, yeah. uh, it was right around the, I think, custom production. And they're not outer. supposed to let people. I think that was this custom production shootout, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it was horrific. It was, yeah. it was, it, was, it wasn't for my mate, Hayden Browning. He, he kept the shark off of me long enough to get it out of the water. It was my fault. I, I they had thrown a couple carcasses in the water I didn't know about off the bow of the mm -hmm. boat and whatever. I, I resemble a sea turtle, so I mean he came, he came up and, a big sea turtle. Yeah, he came up and pushed me into the props, knocked the wind out of me, and I got very lucky again. I do remember back. that. Yeah. I remember Chris Dorn was like helping yeah, trying to fish that, catch that off the dock that day. Yeah, the next yeah. day. Yeah, I fished yeah. for that thing for like a month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gaffs out yeah. and everything. But 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 yeah, the shark, the, the even the sharks off the beaches here, it's just unbelievable. I live in Delray Beach, and I have a uh, a guy who would be awesome for the show. Uh, Jack Swack, Swackhammer, and he's a beach fit shark. That's fisherman. a great name. That's, yeah. his, that's his real yeah. name. And, 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 and Swackhammer. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell him. But I, I actually admire this guy. This guy fishes a 130 off the beach. And if you saw. A 130 off the beach? Dude, that's if awesome. If you saw the sharks this guy has caught off the beaches, he's one of the only people I know that's actually caught great whites off of a beach. Yeah. And he has videos of it, right? Wow. He's, really? He's posted a couple pictures of it lately, but. Yeah. The sharks, he he's super into it, super hardcore. And uh, he has a fighting harness, the 130s. And I mean, He's in the water with them. He releases every one of them very ethically. He takes giant circles. I mean, he, I have seen pictures of him putting his arm down the throat of a tiger shark to get the circle hook out. Like, this guy is all serious. And I'm like, you're crazy. And, yeah. you know, but he really understands that. But don't sharks. you think we need to start to whack some of these things? I mean, man, you know, there's got to be some management. You there's got to be whack, management. Whack is a careful word. You know, right, I didn't mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, right. here's the we thing. don't want to. Like, right. is the, so, right. is yeah. the there's, solution? There's all kill killers them all? sitting here. Yeah. We know this. Yeah. <laughs> is the solution kill them all, or, or no, is the solution no, like better regulation and management? Yeah. Right. So, management. but I mean, I think that part of the kill them, whack them theory is you got to open up the long liners. Absolutely. Again. Yeah. yeah. You got to encourage people to to help help. Uh, do it. Well, Harv can, harvesting sharks can you be can, beneficial. You can do selective. In a lot of ways. You can do selective you harvest the right way. with yeah. sharks. You can do selective harvest with sharks. Right. Because they know where they are. They know what they eat. It wouldn't be hard even if you just used like buoy type gear, independent buoy gear, 
to catch them. But they have to be people have to be encouraged to do yeah. it. It's it's not something fun or it's not something, no. something people want to do. Listen, it's just like managing deer on a ranch. If if there's too many, the rest of the population suffers because there's not enough food. Right. And this is when you run into these issues with Goliath grouper with, with them eating other things and right. all the, all they see a boat fishing is just a, a meal ticket. Mm-hmm. Yep. They know now when the Dinner boat belt. slows down and they hear the engine shifting, they know it's time to eat. That's why all these sailfish are getting eaten. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, what do you, are you protecting the bull shark or are you protecting the sailfish stock? Because now they're, they're right. both going to be affected by it. And this is why organizations like the CCA have taken positive note and listened to it. Organizations like mm-hmm. even the Billfish Foundation has taken positive note because once they find out that sailfish are getting eaten at the boat by sharks, then they're going to take yeah. less. Well, they eat anything. Yeah. Bull sharks yeah. will eat yeah. anything. For yeah. sure. And, yeah. I mean, rightly so. That's what they were put on this planet to do. But right. um, when their numbers are out of whack then things are going to be crazy. I like that we're using the word whack now. Whack. You got <laughs> whack, whack, you whack. to you watch the financial impact of it. Think about, you know, yeah. people mounting sailfish, uh, you know, release mounts, mm-hmm. the charter industry, the sailfish tournament industry, and that's just one species, not to mention right. the reef fish industry. I mean, it, it has to get back into balance. It, it, yes. I remember shark fishing off the beach as a kid. You catch, you get a bite once every three months. Now it takes five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I've caught five spinner sharks in a morning off a of pier, you know, yeah. recently, and it's just... Mm-hmm. It's crazy, and I, the amazing thing is, what's it going to take? Because there's more people getting in the water. You know, there's more people swimming. We're right. getting more populated. Like I hate to, I hate they're to coming in closer. That, that's man, for they're, sure. they're there, yeah. and they're, like your buddy just had that hammerhead. That that video, of that hammerhead was walking along the beach with that huge ass hammerhead, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. just casually like walking that's, along with that's them. That's where the stingrays live. That's yeah. what they eat. Yeah, they're solid, man. Yeah. I mean, they're, the shark, the sharks are going to be. But a listen, serious problem. we never had. Growing up, we never had Goliath groupers in the river. No. no. We were fishing enough to where we would have caught them if they were there. Yeah. Right. And you can go to any boat ramp now, even as far up as past Andrews Avenue in the New River, Yeah. and there's giant Goliath groupers under every dock. Or they're finding bull sharks in those canals up by Pinecrest well, School. The bull like sharks. baby bull sharks. Bull sharks have been in- there. When I was a kid, we used to catch them up there because they live in fresh water. Right. That's where they have their young, but not... Like you to see the them now, yeah, right. You just never saw that many. And we used to swim in there and hydroslide and everything right. else. Never thought twice about it. Now, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I'm going to water. Yeah, now, now we got pollution know. and we got sharks. Yeah. Not a great atmosphere for. Right. It's tough to go in the water now. Yeah, you yeah. see all these sharks tearing up all these fish and, it's and like the pollution. You go to the beach and they're like I gotta keep a closer eye on my kids. Like yeah. every time they go into the beach now, it's like you know what I mean. It's crazy, man. I I mean I've seen some bites take place on the beach. Five hundred yeah. pound bull sharks, literally. The guy in the kayak's not even done rowing back in, and the rod's going off. Yeah, like I've witnessed that personally. You know, like, and, you know, you talk about the pollution too. It's all a trickle down effect. You look at the Pompano kids. I mean, you look at some of the greatest fishermen in the world. They are all part of that. You know, fourteen whaler right. gang of hydro sliders that cruise right. Pompano and the New River. You know, yep. that's the thing that's almost that's almost like a rite of passage to grow up in South Florida, right. and, and right. that's going away. You know, it's yeah. all con- again, it's all connected, connected. By, all connected. Water, yep. by water and. It, it's going to take people like you guys and uh, all of us uh, to make a difference. And if we don't push on it, uh, it's not going to happen. We need to We need to make it an effort. Do you want to give an update on any of your projects right now, or you want to hold fast uh, on that? Things are going great. Uh, we've got the, the the system is is one of the biggest parts of our system. Just got delivered two days ago. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're charging forward, and we're going to clean these waterways up. Nice. Uh, we're going to... We're gonna do it. There is no failure. There is no uh, failure. Is not an option. We're gonna do it. Failure is not an option, right? We're gonna so, do it. So, and we're gonna do a follow-up episode. And I'm reaching episode. with these guys to hear what they think about different ideas, because like they, like Andy said, bait. I mean, the reefs are a mess. I mean, there's so much that needs to happen, and there needs to be a focus on it. Um, from one end to the other, though. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, from, absolutely. From the Everglades to. Right. To blue water, it's it's all connected. It is. That's what, that's that's so that's the whole point of it, right? Yeah. It, it's like no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we're always connected by wires. We always right. say this is a South Florida based show. Yeah, you know what I mean. Even though we bring in people from all over the world, it's a South Florida based show, right? We would care more about our land here because that's what we can control, mm-hmm. right? So you're right. From the river of grass all the way to the Gulf Stream, right, and then all the way down through the Florida Straits up to the lake yep. and then beyond the headwaters, right? And 
That's yeah. what we did. This is what we got to like manage and take care of. Yeah. And there's, it's so many layers to it, whether it's impervious surfaces and like new construction or whether it's runoff from sugar fields or, or, or whether it's, you know, just, just flat out runoff from the intercoastal the concrete in people's yards and seepage pesticides. From pipes, and like also, seepage from pipes. Yeah. So many layers to this, right? But it's mm-hmm. all got to be managed. It's all got to be controlled. Everyone wants to point their finger at one thing. Like I remember the big thing was big sugar. Everyone wants to point their finger just at big sugar. Well, it's not that simple. Saying they're innocent, and I'm not saying you don't point the figure, but it's not just them. No, it's yeah. a lot. Too. You know what I mean? There's a lot more to it than that, right? Sure. You want to go? You want to share any further details about what you got going on right now, or do you want to hold on that? That's kind of what I was getting at. Um, you want to wait till a follow yeah, up? Yeah, we can do we'll, a follow up. We'll follow up. Follow on up. That. And, right, and no just problem. and um and uh, I just want to particularly because. Jason shared this story with us. No, yeah, you, you don't have to explain that. No, no, I, I, I just because we're going to do an so entire we're going to do an entire follow up episode. No, this has that. nothing to do with that. Just, okay. I just want to thank Jason no, for sharing pleasure, this story because so many of the youth and younger fishermen have no idea yeah. about this story yeah. and about. I recommend all you younger kids and the younger fishermen, you all read this book and check it out because it's an amazing story. And uh, Jason gave you a, a, a basically a highlight of it, mm-hmm. um, but it trust me, it, it's a story that not I'm surprised not, you know, we're getting old. Yeah, we're um, getting old. This is part of what we, we talked about. When we were drinking rum at the bar up there earlier before the show started. We talked about um, you know the culture and the heroes and the legends and all the things like that. And part of that is understanding the history of what we've actually lived through. Right, like sure. in our time, or like, be, or just earlier in our time, right? And understanding, you know, generations to come, knowing like what that root is and where it came from, and knowing these stories that led up to what things are here, like understanding why that seawall looks like that, or understanding why that beach looks like that right now, or understanding, you know, who that person is rolling in on that boat and why that person's important or why that boat is important. Right. Quite frankly. You they know, respect yeah. these guys. Are, these guys are legends, uh, and uh, I can't say enough about them. And, and Thanks, uh, they've been through a lot, uh, and they've taught me a lot. And uh, I'm so stoked that Jason shared this story. Yeah, me too. On this you show, me? I uh, mean, thank you, man. I plan on sharing it with a lot of people. Just yeah, not even just fishermen either. You know, yes. again, I think I think in this day and age, with everything going on, like really appreciate the f- appreciating the fact that you wake up every morning and you have ability to breathe, even if it's with a mask on. Right, like, yeah. it's staying present, man. Like that's 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 what I I learned the most out of it, you know. And and um, eight eight near death experiences I've had, and I wasn't really paying attention to that. And then I realized I'm alive to kind of share the story. So I I I see that as my life's work. I so, see that as my future. So the book's coming out in the next six months. You're yeah, hoping? In the, by the end of the year, I'm hoping by Christmas, you know, the book's going to be done, you know, complete and available and uh but it's a thing like i don't put a time frame on it anymore right. you know a lot of people believe me i have hundreds of people like dude are you done yet with it the thing is it, it has changed so many times right. because initially it was a thriller and then it went to kind of like this i don't know self-help thing and then it, now it's kind of like a mix of both of it to where anybody can pick it up and read it and get some positivity out of it right anybody can pick it up it'll be one of the best stories ever told and that's it man it's just all it's all about choice the, the bottom line to sum it up it's it's about the power of choice and most importantly we don't have to like the things we choose but once you choose something you empower yourself and dennis and like john that. right you guys have never heard this story before nope right and you guys are both fishermen been around yeah. i mean are it's you, were, pieces was it very, here mm-hmm. there but not the whole thing from bookend mm-hmm. to bookend like that yeah. you know that that was you know phenomenal and 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 that was a this that was a yeah no snippet for sure for sure I mean I, I mean yeah you don't want to let you let the complete cat out yeah of yeah, yeah there's a lot of sub stories and, yeah for a sure a lot of sub stories in it but you know again it, it's funny it's funny um how it's all come around like you heard me say earlier like I didn't want that to be my defining moment I didn't mm-hmm. want to be known for that at 48 years old I've learned that I have to go back with this book and actually recreate that and be defined by it because there's so much value. In, I believe there's so much value, and other people also believe there's a lot of value in the story and the lessons of it. The lessons so, of so, it. So when I was 23, I didn't want to be defined by the story, so I, I did everything to, become a, to be known as a good fisherman, right? Mm-hmm. And I learned from guys like him and him. And, and, um, and now, at 48, 
like I, 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 if you if you ask people what they know about me, they'll say I'm a good fisherman. They don't know the story. So now I'm actually going back in and 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 re you know redefining who I am with the story, which is an amazing journey. For yeah, me. that's good. Knox, my it's brother. An, it's that's an amazing good. journey. Knox, my it's brother. Good. Because right it's not for, it's Knox, not, my brother. Cool, man. It's not. Good. For We're me. connected by handshakes else. and connected okay. by water, man. Cool. You're the man. No, yeah. man. We're all the. We're you're all the man, men. and you're the man. I'm serious. Thank you guys so much for coming today. This Thank you for having beautiful. us. Thanks beautiful, for getting this all together, man. Yeah, yeah man. That's great. For sure. We got more rum to drink at the bar, I'm sure. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah. And um, I want to say, right, real quick, that, you know, like, yeah, truly, it, I mean, again, one last time, just, 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 so, just so there's, like, the true impact of how I feel about this. Like, thank you. My pleasure, man. Okay. Thank you for thank allowing you for me to share that. it. Thank, thank you. you for doing Thank you that. for thanking me. So it, it, it really, it's not lost on me. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Andy, thank you very much. Once Thanks for having me. For, for, no, it's you, great. Uh, great to be here. Supposed to be hunting right now, but you. We should all get together again and do another roundup yeah. when the book's coming out or yeah. something. That would Absolutely. be, that would be really You'll get the, cool. one of the first copies, man. I'm right not sure of it. I love it. I yeah. love right. it. Cool. All right. So listen, if you're in the market for a new truck or a new vehicle, right? Visit our fine friends at Joey Cardi Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. And go see my buddy Dean. He will hook you up. If you tell him that I sent you, you're probably going to get a better price <laughs> than just being Joe Schmo off the street. I heard a rumor that that's true. I don't know if it I is believe true it. or not, but it might be true. You might want to give it a shot and try, though, at least. Right? Um, also, if you're thirsty, and I know you are, right, enjoy yourself a glass of Papa's Pilar rum. They remind you never to be a spectator. Right? You can have the blonde. You can have the dark. You can have the Marquesas. It's all good. Right? Um... And also, if you're hungry, go visit our friends at Papa's Raw Bar, right? You can get the best food on the planet, right, for the best people. So, and um, they, Troy and Cassie got it dialed in. We love them to death, right? All right. We good? Cool, man. We're good, awesome. man. Awesome. Thank All right. you. Awesome. Thank right. you very much, guys. And also, remember, your ego is not, not your, your amigo, amigo, right? Always yep. do your best and let God do the rest. And no matter what, do not forget, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we're always connected by water. water. Thank you. Cool, man. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.